Yeah, I, I have one announcement to make. So, participation certificate are uh, ready. If those who want their participation certificate, they can collect it from IOC. I see. I see. I So welcome back uh, after the lunch session. Uh, hope you're not sleepy after a wonderful lunch. Uh, weather is gloomy outside, uh, but still we we'll continue with the lecture. Uh, first lecture is uh, June party, so we will have um, four lectures before the tea break. Um, I expect the, all the speakers will, will keep on time. So first lecture is by June party. Please, June, June, June. Sure. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, I thank organizers. Organizers for me, giving me an opportunity to talk about my work on this meeting. So I'll be talking on multi evidence view of a classical tutor is the that is named Sulicha, which is located in the similar Panda cloud. So I'll start with this cartoon diagram that's one previous session talk. And it was explained. Just to add to this uh, the, uh, explanations, here it is a magnetospheric, magnetospheric accretions where the strong magnetic field will produce the dark spots on the surface of the star. When the star rotates around its axis, that will give the modulation on the optical light. This if magnet this magnetosphere is linked with connected with this disk, then it forms a well, it channels the material from disk to the stellar surface and dumps the material on the stellar surface, which will produce the uh, hot atmosphere here, the hot continuum and UV emission also. And just above the UV emission, uh, there is a form generation because the P4, the soft generates. That shock will produce the X ray here. If the magnetic field lines are not connected here, so they will produce the coronal emissions, coronal X ray emissions. The magnetic field here generated is basically the dynamo activities. So that coronal emission sometimes will be uh, absorbed by the disk, the outer disk here, and disk here. 
the differential rotation of the central star in this magnetic field sometimes results into the magnetic field lines to be bulge out, which will throw out the material from the stars on selections. And the inner part of the disk that will give the bipolar flow sometimes comes as a jet. And outer part has a dusty disk. So each the important thing is that this entire thing is a harbor of emission of electromagnetic radiation from X-ray to the radial leaf. So it's a good but good things to understand the emission of the region. So with this brief introduction, I will come to my object that is again I just say this CV chart that is a classical Titori stars. It is the brightest one here in the chameleon dark clouds. The so rotation period was found to be earlier that 4.2 to 4.4 days, which is with the uh, very sparse photometric response of well constrained here, located at 193 parsec distance. It is a binary component with, with the binary separation of 11.4 of sequence quite a far. So the magnetic activity here of the one star, this is also the another uh, story star, but there's an effect with each other because of the distance, the wide binary. The spectral time was coined as G8 and T. These are the basic parameter luminosity, mass, and radiation that was found in a part of previous studies. It was found to the strongest X ray source in the, this cloud with X ray luminosity of 10 to the power 30.4 lux per second. And also, the high level of the atmospheric activity has been found in the past within the UV spectroscopy. Uh, the recently, I would say not recently, but a decade ago, uh, using the spectropolarimetry study, uh, they sent it all that they found the polar spots, that is, dark polar caps here, and low latitude spots, dark spots on the surface, it's showing to the high level of the magnetic field in the particular star. So, to view with this, so I was interested doing the, this, the just to multi study of this particular objects. So for that, in 2012, we proposed, we have, we have observed this using the soft shift. Then the shift data was uh, uh, supplemented by the two archival data from Maxim Newton and Chandra. The shift data was uh, simultaneous with the X-ray as well as in the UV bands. These are the UV bands. And the optical data was the long-term optical survey data was available with this I just use this data for two or understand optical variability here. That is all sky automatic surveys, uh, the sport mask at all, which is from uh, uh, guy. And IR, just to supplement IR in yeah, mid infrared data, just make a spectral energy distribution just to check uh, uh, with the uh, CD models of orbital at all. Then you found these parameters. Which are consistent with the literature one. The important thing is the AV is 1.1, which is useful for my X ray model, X ray uh, spectral modeling. And you just see the, uh, the mass, disk mass, of, uh, envelope mass separation, and the disk mass separation are out of 24 minus 7 to 24 minus 8. That's coming to the V band data. This long term V band data, if you see here, and you see that it's a visual, the visual instruction itself shows the long term variability here. Just adjust uh, over toward the sine curve here just to just to guide the whether the variability is how the variability looks like here. Even if there are long-term variability, there are sort of fluctuations are also available here. So to know exactly the whether these are the periodic or what, I did the uh, Fourier transform that is the in the long scalar method, the standard method that we have now. The blue line here is the long scalar, the clean. Is a method, other method of the uh, Fourier transform, which usually uh, removes the noise by by dewhitening all these things. And the dark one is uh, this uh, black one is a window function. This usually shows that if the periodic variability is available because of the data waves and R. So where we remove all these data, where we remove all the peaks where this dark this black one was available because it's because of the gaps of the data. So we found the two prominent period here. One is two six three seven days, which corresponds approximately seven years. This is, looks like this. 
and other one is a 3.713 days that is the rotational velocity. Thus, could be the rotational velocity, and I'll see the next slide whether it's a rotational momentum. Long uh, uh, I'll discuss later the how very material. So to just to, to just uh, so that whether this long term, uh, the short term variability is 3.71 degrees consistent or not. So, what we did is that I just divided this all the light term to 12 different time segments and folded it with the period of 3.741 day. Then I found that all the light curves are nicely folded. And if you see that this is the time spans, this is in MJD uh, time spans in days, um, uh, modified Boolean days. And the upper one, if you see that these are, this is the first one is a Amplitude, second one is a phase of the medium, and third one is the mean brightness. What's the parameter? So, if you see that, that all these three parameters, these parameters are varying from one epoch of the observation to the another epoch of the observation. So, these are the well folded, so 2.741 day period is here. Then we see the change in amplitude, we see the change in shape of light, we see that the shape of light from here to here is not consistent, it's changing from one. Why it is changing? That you see the change in phase of the mini one. This is because they have a dark spot on their surface that I told in the introduction. But dark, it depends on the magnetic field distance. It, ch it changes the size with the time. And sometimes there will be no, sometimes there will be a lot of dark spots. So that's what the shape is changing. That's what the amplitude is changing. That's what the phase of mini one is changing. Then I'll just go to the next two point in the next slide. Then what I did is that I just plot it. Uh, with the day, this phase of minima, then phase of minima, then we see that that they are uh, located along two lines. The two phase of minima that you see the, the light curve is seen only one, but they are two. They are well separated by 0.5 phase. 0.5 phase, I would say that is a width 180 degree of the longitude. Okay, so this kind of the phenomena visually appears when there is a cool spot on the surface of the stars in case of the solar type of the stars. Similarly, you see the amplitude is not constant also. And this is the variation of the maximum minimum and the mean light here. So, in a similar fashion. So, the variability here, that optical variability here, is basically presence of the cool spot. This would give you the approximately 0.1 magnitude of the variability. However, the, it is also, and it is also very, the light is also very due to the presence of the hot spot, which will be up to three magnitudes, quite a large. So quite a small, even if it could be because of the hot spot, you cannot distinguish between hot spot and cool spot, which one is a prominent here. Dips of the luminosity are also available, uh, presence in the light code, you can't see it in the current data. So it appears that from the current, this analysis, both hot spot as well as the cool spot is responsible for the uh, uh, variability in the optical light curve. This is a UV. Uh, uh, you see that this is long term UV observations, again, approximately of the four days. The few of them are the continuous one, just through the rotational modulation here again. But few of them are so quite as sparse, doesn't show the rotational modulation because the light curve from one observation, one season of the one epoch of the observation to the another epoch of the observations, they changes their amplitude, variability of the time, even if you see in the previous diagram. So the, their variability is superimposed over here, over, over here. So we couldn't see the uh, 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 the modulation in the other bands. So the modulation in UV is also probably due to the hot spot, basically hot spot modulation is quite large. But at the same time, the photospheric UV emission is also there, which could be due to the presence of the dark spots on the surface. I'll stress on this. Uh, X-ray in detail. So we observe the X-ray uh, from the swift here. These are the X-ray light curves that the earlier light curve that I saw was 2001 light curve by the Chandra. So the small kind of the variability, but uh, the variability is not a periodic. Even if this only the 0.8 days, the period is uh, approximately 3.7 days. But the, vari the variability looks like here it's going up and slightly uh, trending towards the down. Which could be emergence of the small scale uh, star flares on the surface of the uh, T20 stars, this CV chart. The other two observations that is taken by us, that is by the Swift as well as with the XM Newton, they don't show any variability even if we give the chi spectrum. So these 
even if these are the approximately four years of the light curve, you just see that it are almost consistent light curve from the switch. So what we did is that then we started with X-ray spectra. The here is a X-ray spectra from all three of the missions. This is your top one is a chandra. This is a maximum, and uh, the lower one is a shift one. The as you see that. I just fitted the thermal plasma model that we call it the astrophysical plasma emission code here, which usually tells, uh, basically the continuum is tells by the thermal strong here. And top of that, we have a line emission from, taken from the uh, line list. So this is the broadband spectra. Then I fit it, then I found that the temperature is approximately 1 keV, that's 0.97 keV here, which corresponds, which corresponds, uh, which corresponds to the 11.2 uh, millikelvin here. If you see the emission value is 4.2 into 53 and abundance is 0 0.08 times of the solar abundance, which is quite close to the abundance found in the other TW star. And the X-ray luminosity, if you see that, we just found that X-ray luminosity 2 band, 0.5 to 2 and 2 to 78. Then we found that it is a more X-ray luminous in the soft X-ray band than the other one. Then I would say that's in the soft X-ray source. Uh, so for soft X-ray, I have not coined it because it's used for the X-ray binary people. So it's a very soft X-ray source. Uh, then I try to find out whether uh, the origin of the X-ray emission whether it's accretion as well as uh, the magnetic origin, magnetic, magnetic and fan origin. So these are the origin of the either the coronal structure, large scale fairing, your small scale fairing, which are as a results of the dynamo activities, dynamo process. Other one is the equation of the matrix due to the SOG, the plasma is written due to the X ray here. If it is a SOG, then the SOG temperature will be given by these relations the, where this is the SOG velocity, I take as a free fall velocity. So I calculated this around 1.5 million Kelvin. If I see the previous one, then I will have 11.2 million Kelvin from the X ray observation, which is an order of the less than this, the order level, order more than this one. So the X ray emission, if from this particular star that I would say is a magnetically uh, confined plasma rather than the uh, accretion star. It has a, of course, there are a few stars that they saw the both uh, simultaneously the accretion as well as the magnetically confined plasma here. So that thing I just uh, tried to see the small uh, smallness, I would say the compactness of some people call it the smallness by this parameter, which comes around 0.2, then Robert, they found they related correlated with the density. They found that if the this parameter is less than two, the density will be around 10 to what less than 10 to 10 centimeter temperature, which is basically in found in the, uh, 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 the coronal confined plasma, not in the case of the equation source, where the density is quite large. So the soft temperature of 1.5 million T and low density indicates that the X-ray is dominated by magnetically confined coronal rather than the uh, equation. Things. As I mentioned that CBH has a soft X-ray source and it's a luminous, X-ray luminous at minus minus three four. The previous luminosity of the recent luminosity form, it was found to be more luminous than the previous one. So even if you have a better sensitivity of the X-ray in the soft X-ray source, then you could have observed the component of the X-ray emission through the soft as well as X-ray emission through the uh, uh, magnetically confined plasma. The Sibicha seems to be the strongest X ray emit emitter in the Emilian town, journey to the classical territory star WW uh, Jaw in the region. So, this is my uh, uh, one line conclusion here that Sibicha of a type found is a periodic variable with a period of 3.714 days, in which the observed modulation in optical and UV bands could be due to the mixture of both hot and Cool surface spots, whereas the X-ray emission appears to be dominated by the magnetically confined corona. This is it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jivan. Yeah, Manoj, you have a question. Jivan, I just put the previous slide where you show the density thing. Uh, this, this. This is electron densities, right? Yeah, electron. These densities are, aren't they on the higher side to be? You, you're talk, talking about the X ray origin from the coronal yes. region. Yeah. Isn't it a little uh, higher on the polar corona? See, it's it's this particular... density is 10 to the 12 particle per cc. It's, it's, it's molecular hydrogen. But I, 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 no, it's because I, I found that even if the solar type is cut, the trends of the density are found. Electron density is found. 
Now, even in the solar types, so there is a low density. Okay, here is a disk, and the coronal plasma is there. Temperatures are too high. So that amount of the, because of the accretion of uh, accretion kind of thing, uh, soft kind of thing, that kind of the density will be there. This is the general range of the solar type of this stuff. No, 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 no. But solar corona is not distance. No. Solar corona is around yeah, 10 to the power 9 to 10 to the power 10. Yes. But come on. This is 10 to the power 10. Yes. Yes, I do. The tone density is that much, actually. Very yeah. In the earlier part of your presentation, you showed that there are two periodicities and that phase difference of 0.5 you attributed to cold spots, right? Yes. So how do you explain to the presence of cold spots phase uh, difference of in case of the hot spot, uh, it's okay, fine. This is usually that, uh, of course, there is a, uh, uh, if, if, if there are the, always there are, so in the, if the spots are not existing in the single, they are always in the two, they, because they have to the polarity. Because of there are the two spots always in the, in case of the. And they are large? They are large. They are large enough, because they, they are large enough, that's what we are thinking. If you are thinking of point one. Yeah. Point one, that means it's approximately around 10 percent of the uh, stellar surface. No, no, but the time period also matches the rotation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> of course. Of course. Even if you tell some people can find out the difference of the because they are because they are they are located in a different part of the latitude of the star. Okay. Yeah. So you have one question? Yeah, that is seven, seven, seven. Yes, that's only seven. Yes, that this period is basically again. I am saying this is still confusing. That is because of both actually the active regions as well as the hot spot region. They last up for that at times. The hot spot region is also last up for that times after that that longer time. So this is because of mostly because of any one of them. So we cannot distinguish from the such data whether it's because of the hot spot because of the cold spot. Yeah, that is basically the response function actually. Not exactly, otherwise everything is the same because if I, I do the individual the parameterization part is yes. Yeah. Yes. Another yes. question is you mentioned about another companion which is near to Right. I mean, how much AU separation between those? Your objective? Uh, I didn't calculate it. It's around 11.4 arc seconds at 993. Then it's 11 can calculate it. Right. So, primarily, that is not having any business in this, right? Yes, I was thinking that it will have any business because what happens if they are the binary, if so they try to try to rotate faster and try to rotate, uh, try to become the synchronized, so that they are rotating the very faster, then magnetic activity will be higher. Yeah, it's a quite a wide binary, so they will have a elliptic binary, so they don't have any. Yes. I have a question. Like these two uh, four spots, like, is there any biasness in the location of these four spots uh, over the star? Like, usually, four spots they found uh, if you go to the sun, they found to the higher latitude of the uh, of the surface. Okay. I will just follow up with you. What is the inclination angle of the source? Like, it's, it's around 668 degrees, like something like 68. Yeah. I don't remember the place around 60 to 50 degrees around that time. Okay. Okay. You, just take one, one question. So, you have two different periods for this star, right? Yes. Two points in the year, given the star. So, you have uh, separated one period first and then it's still you have to the second period. No, not. I have done the The same thing is they are present in the uh, forest. Okay. That I can do that. That I can be done, but we have one can be done and can be separated out of the previous. Okay. The same thing is they are available. Okay, exactly. Other thing is that this is 10 metric star. Your photometry error is quite large for this 10 metric star. Uh, yes, sir. Come on. This is ASA's telescope of the around 50 centimeters. Okay, it is 50 centimeters. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. okay. Well, if there are no more questions, mm -hmm. let's thank you again. Thank you. Okay. Uh, so, <laughs> next lecture by Namita Atta from I Bangalore. So, since we, gone, we are in the review of the statistics. So, mm, uh, total 15 minutes. So, I think I will remind you after 10 minutes that you have to start. So, you have to start with the Which one? Uh, Namita. What's in today's? 
Ya, no me interesa cambiar. Uh, so, good afternoon, everyone. First of all, I'd like to thank the organizers for providing me the opportunity to uh, present my work here. So, uh, today I'll be talking about the near infrared view of protosolar jets. So the, I'll begin by giving a brief introduction of our protostellar jets and their association with massive stars and how they manifest at near infrared wavelengths and uh, some observational evidences as well. Yeah. Uh, so as we heard in the previous talks on the first day, uh, 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 the protostellar jets are ubiquitous to star forming regions, both in the uh, from low mass stars to high mass stars, and they can be observed over a wide range of wavelengths from X-rays to radio. So, for example, this is the uh, three color composite HST image of a well known star forming region G35.2 minus 0.74 N. So, uh, this and is known to have uh, an outflow activity. So, this is the blown up version of the central region of this uh, source, and the color scale and the uh, white contours uh, represent the uh, uh, narrow band Fe2 and H2 uh, images uh, at the near infrared wavelengths. So as can be seen, the, at these two wavelengths, they have an elongated morphology in the north-south direction and, uh, is a, and, this, uh, and is a part of a, a, a protostellar jet. And the case, uh, and similarly at the uh, radio wavelength at six centimeter also follows a similar uh, uh, elongated morphology in the same direction. And the, uh, uh, the dust emission associated with this source is mapped at uh, the alma 870 micron and, and is seen to, I mean, and is uh, shown in the uh, uh, the sign contours. So now, uh, when a protostar accretes matter from the surrounding envelope, uh, the through a circumstellar like disk, some of the matter eject, is ejected away from the uh, protostar through the polar axis, and these carry away excess angular momentum through from the uh, rotating accretion disk. Now, the detection of uh, the these uh, bipolar outflows becomes important in the early stages of star formation, especially in the cases of massive stars where these YSOs are highly embedded and the direct observation of such accretion processes is not possible. So such bipolar outflows acts as indirect tracers of accretion in, uh, uh, high, uh, accretion in high mass stars. Now, as the high velocity jets uh, escape from the poles of the protostar, they entrain gas and dust from the cocooning envelope and that hence drives large scale molecular outflows and these such more collimated high velocity jets and large scale molecular outflows in the from massive stars play a crucial role in radiatively and chemically influencing the interstellar medium. Now, as these jets they interact with the interstellar medium, they produce shocks within their immediate vicinity that can heat up the uh, surroundings to around 1000 Kelvin, which results in thermal emission from shock trends. And such shock excited emissions are mainly observed at uh, uh, optical and infrared wavelengths. So, for example, this is the uh, uh, continuous refracted H2 image for the star forming region G35.2 uh, N. And the, uh, these authors have reported a, a, a multi, a double uh, a two bipolar outflows in the northeast southwest directions. One is this, and the other second outflow is this. Now, as can be seen, these uh, uh, lobes have a, collimate, uh, have a collimated flow and have several knots which are numbered over here along these flows. Now to understand the spectral carriers of these uh, outflow, uh, uh, these collimated outflows, they carried out the spectroscopic observations uh, towards, sorry, uh, towards uh, one, uh, the couple of the uh, knots that is four and five. And the spectra extracted is uh, shown here. Now, as can be seen, the whole spectra is rich in uh, molecular hydrogen lines like these and also uh, Fe2 lines. So both of these lines are uh, excellent tracers of uh, protostellar jets in the near infrared region. Now, along with these lines, uh, the uh,
Yeah, and the FE2 line is uh, mostly associated with high velocity gas than H2, and it also complements the H2 observations. Now, despite the importance of uh, near infrared image and spectroscopic uh, analysis to understand the properties of protostellar jets, especially for uh, massive stars where the uh, accretion process cannot be observed because since it's highly embedded. The studies uh, to uh, the stu such studies are uh, rather still limited. So, keeping this in mind, uh, we have carried out uh, uh, we have uh, carried out the dedicated spectroscopic uh, observations towards a couple of outflow sources: uh, G twelve point four two plus zero point five zero and G nineteen point eight eight minus zero point five three. So, these are the two uh, sources, and uh, this is the mid infrared view of both the sources from the uh, Glenn's uh, survey using Spitzer. And the red line here uh, on both the uh, images shows are the proposed jet directions. So, this is the, uh, these are the continuous subtractor. So, this is the continuous subtractor H2 image from the UH2 survey, and this is the continuum subtractor FE2 image from, uh, you got, got from UCAT observations. And the uh, blue contours uh, correspond to the 4.5 micron emission from the, uh, the uh, Spitzer Airlock band. Now, uh, as can be seen from both the images, both H2 and FE2 show extended emissions towards the peak of the 4.5 micron emission. Now, to get a better picture of the spectral carriers of this, uh, the, uh, the near infrared wavelengths, we carried out uh, the near infrared spectroscopic observations using the UIST instrument on. Uh, Eucard, which is situated in Monachium. And, um, yeah. and the slit was oriented in such a way that uh, in, along the direction of the jet and the uh, spectra were extracted along three approaches. So the approaches A1 and A2 samples with to the two uh, 4.5 micron peaks and these uh, spectra, the approach A3 samples the nebulosity seen towards the uh, southwest of the source. So this is the, these are the spectra extracted towards the uh, all the three approaches. This is A1, A2, and A3, and similar uh, are these. So as can be seen, there are clear detections of uh, H2 lines and an H1 line to, uh, uh, towards the approach A1, and there's also a faint detection of an FE2 line as well. But in the case of uh, the approaches A2 and A3, no lines were detected above the noise level. And these are the lines that were detected and their uh, corresponding wavelengths. Now, similar in the case of G1988 as well, this is the uh, continuum subtracted H2 image from we got from this uh, paper. So as can be seen from here, there's a clear uh, bipolar outflow in the east-west direction, which is seen by the uh, H2 knots in the, uh, uh, the background image. And the, the black ellipses here uh, are called the, uh, uh, identified as the molecular hydrogen emi emission objects, which are uh, identified by these uh, authors. And the numbers are their uh, catalog entries. The yellow contours corresponds to the H2 emission from the UH2 survey. And the uh, red contours are the emission from the 4.5 micron uh, yeah, emission from the IRAC band. So, uh, so we, this also the uh, spectroscopic observations were carried out uh, uh, by aligning the slit in such a way that it samples the uh, uh, H2 emission. So here the spectra were extracted along two approaches, K1 and K2, which samples the MHO2204. And K3 samples the MHO2203. Yeah, so this is the spectra extracted towards all the three approaches. And as can be seen, there are uh, very prominent <coughs> H2, several prominent H2 lines seen towards all the three uh, approaches. So these are the lines extracted and, uh, and their corresponding wavelengths. Uh, so now we have seen, uh, like we have detected several H2 lines, but what is the origin of these lines? They are they thermal or are they uh, thermally excited or are they normally uh, not thermally excited? In the case of no thermal excitation, the shock neutral gas in the outflows uh, or uh, jets are heated up to 1000 Kelvin and the, um, the molecular hydrogen excites to lower vibrational levels. And in the case of non thermal excitation, uh, the, uh, the excitation is due to the UV fluorescence by non ionizing UV photons. 
And in this case, the hydrogen atoms are, I mean, molecules are excited to higher vibrational states. Now, in the case of both G1242 and G1988, all the H2O lines have a low level of excitation, which suggests that they have a thermal origin. And hence, the excitation will be very low. 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 And hence, the excitation will be very
uh, have a multi wavelength uh, database for a large number of sources with uh, uh, we have this alma atoms data and we have the with the put uh, the nir data can be made into a large sample so maybe we got to do something with this also. yes yes like yeah we can do that but i have not thought about it is to derive the physical correct, 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 yes. yeah okay thank you Thanks. Uh, so we have to stop. Okay. Let's on here. Okay. So um, there is some change in the solution. So the Ekta Sharma will speak of, uh, on exploring the uh, gas kinetics in the Bible regions. So Ekta, um, you have the uh, 50 minutes. So I will just talk to you. Okay. I'll, uh, Victor, you have to fix it. Okay. No, no, it's okay. Talk normally. Hello. Hello. On it. From the bottom. Last. One more. Yes, 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 yes. Hello. Yes. Just below the neck. Yes. Good afternoon, everyone. So, first of all, I would like to thank the organizers for giving me the opportunity to present my work today. So, today I'll be talking about uh, gas kinematics of bipolar H2 regions. So, H2 regions, they are the volume of ionized gas around the massive OB stars, and they are formed as a result of photoionization of cloud material by massive stars. And they can be ultra compact. Uh, H2 regions uh, of around the size uh, less than 0.1 parsec, or they can be classical H2 regions, classical ionized region greater than 0.1 parsec. So these classical H2 regions, they can further show cometary or bipolar morphologies. And uh, as we know that these ionized regions, if they expand in the interstellar medium, then uh, they can uh, generate, new, uh, it can uh, create new generation of uh, stars. So basically these H2 regions, they are the birth sites of uh, uh, birth sites of uh, new uh, first or second generation of formation. So, and uh, generally, uh, evolution of these H2 regions, so generally, evolution of uh, I don't know, I mean, the pointer. Pointer is tough. Okay. 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 So evolution of these H2 regions is generally based on the spherical symmetry. And these spherical or the cometary or visceral H2 regions, they have been uh, relatively well studied uh, depending on the observations. But uh, these bipolar H2 regions, so I'll be explaining the morphologies further. So uh, they are the simple morphologies uh, which, uh, which, which can allow us to locate the neutral and ionized morphology together in a simpler manner as compared to the other H2 regions. So, uh, after Borden, uh, Bordenheimer 1979, uh, wearing et al. Uh, 2017 has found out that these massive stars, when they evolve in the sheet like molecular cloud, the formed bubble uh, has the bipolar structure. So, here you can see that um, this H2 region, this is exciting star. So, when it expands in the interstellar medium, this ionized region, it, it can create first generation core around the waist of uh, this uh, bipolar nebula. And then along uh, Along the uh, further with the uh, with, with the further evolution, uh, this uh, particular uh, high density structure perpendicular to this bipolar region that can create more uh, second generation cores uh, perpendicular to the axis of this bipolar nebula. So this uh, Fukuda and Hanawa 2000 uh, they also show that H2 regions H2 uh, uh, region expansion near this filamentary structure as I just explained they can generate sequential waves and it can create star forming cores along the long axis of filament. 
So uh, Dervan et al. 2015 and Samal et al. 2018 identified these bipolar H2 regions in the galactic plane with these Pitzer images. And they've used these uh, many uh, uh, sample of uh, data sets. So basically, it was a multivalent study. And the identification was done within the galactic plane uh, with this longitude and this galactic latitude range. And they, they found out that these bipolar regions, they indeed form in this uh, dense flat or sheet-like structure. So basically, the, uh, the consensus that uh, these, uh, basically the, the expansion that will happen in the spherical manner, uh, with these uh, observation and with these study, it was found out that the morphology of uh, the cold gas that is uh, really like a sheet-like structure, when you see it, John, it looks like a, like a, a linear structure in the plane of sky projection. So these are some of the examples of uh, bipolar H2 region. So you can see here uh, that uh, in the Spitzer uh, micron emission, this has two bipolar lobes. And these are other examples from the same study. Then I'm just showing here for the better understanding schematic view of the bipolar H2 region. So this is the pink one is the H2 region, which is expanding in the interstellar medium. And this gray one is pH emission. And uh, towards this uh, waste, uh, of the bipolar nebula here, there are a cluster of these YSOs and uh, which is basically uh, around around the waist of this bipolar nebula. So the now the question is, so they, they argued that bubbles, these they evolve in the 3D medium, but depending on the thickness of the cloud. So basically uh, the triggered star formation or the cluster star formation that is happening in this bipolar nebula that is coming from these filamentary clouds that is that I've just explained along uh, the towards the center of these bipolar structures. So it is uh, really important that uh, we need to study that how the um, the kinematics or the velocity structure. So, so this is the RGB image and this one also. So this red line is in uh, the uh, this is a uh, Herschel emission map which is imposed over these uh, three uh, three which is so this is a. Uh, this uh, red emission is uh, the column density uh, structure, which is really showing that there is a, a filamentary like uh, part uh, perpendicular to this bipolar uh, bipolar structure. So, uh, one I'll just give one example here. This Watkins et al. 2019 they showed. So, they have studied one of the example from that sample G316. They showed that after studying the kinematics using high density tracers and uh, some diffuse gases, that the filamentary configuration that was too massive and dense that it strongly reduces the disruptive effects that the stellar feedback can have on the gas. So basically, if there is a massive uh, star at the center of the nebula, it is not necessarily that it will, com it will completely destroy the material around it. So it is really important that we need to know that what is the gas motion uh, towards that structure. So, uh, and that structure can have a signature of accretion also towards the center of nebula. So these are some of the best examples, best examples which were showing uh, filamentary uh, structures. So I have uh, just started this with uh, this particular um, bipolar H2 region for which uh, I will be showing preliminary results here. So you can see here that uh, these, this is again the RGB image and you can see this uh, uh, beautiful uh, bipolar structure for this region. And uh, so it has these three uh, bubbles, S18, S19, and 20. And in this image, you can see this is a filamentary structure towards uh, this part. And uh, which is indeed uh, uh, giving a hint that there may be, and the cluster of the stars was also around uh, this uh, center also. So we need to know that what is the kinematics uh, around, uh, what is the kinematics towards this filamentary structure. So here, uh, so I've used the uh, sedition data for 13 CO and C18021. So for the large scale structure of these filaments, I have basically mostly used 13 CO and for the high density part C18. So here you can see the background image is the column density, and these were the three uh, 13 CO um, uh, contours, uh, in, uh, integrated intensity contours for 13 CO. So the systematic velocity from the average profile was found out as around uh, minus 71 kilometer per second. So we can see here that, um, okay, so this line is not that dark. So I have from, uh, so I have extracted the filaments uh, from this uh, 13 CO structure, but I'm mostly focusing over uh, towards this line, this uh, filament spine, which is going towards the center, towards the exciting star of this bipolar nebula. And then uh, by looking at the skeleton of uh, the structure, I found out that here you can see just for one small uh, part that, uh, so these are basically 
So these are basically the dust and uh, dust column density and the temperature uh, variation along that filamentary, uh, filamentary structure. So the starting point is uh, the the start uh, starting point is towards the bottom uh, left. So starting from the down from the south. So we can see here that the variation starting from uh, NH2 that uh, depending on so, so the C1 is basically this one and C2 is this part. So these two lines shows the location of these two high density clumps. So you can see that there are uh, high density, which is as expected. And then for the dust temperature map, uh, which is uh, expected that around C2, there, there should be uh, less temperature, but it is showing that it is a warm dust emission around this core. And uh, this one is uh, well reflecting that this is a cold density structure. And when we look at the velocity, uh, centroid velocity variation along the spine, it was found out that there's a, around towards this high density core, which is the most massive one, it shows a, uh, velocity gradient. So, uh, um, depending on the depending on the variation along this uh, slope, uh, the velocity gradient was found out as uh, 0.4 kilometer per second per parsec, which is uh, so I'll explain it later. So, and uh, while looking at the velocity dispersion, um, it showed that uh, the line widths are quite turbulent, and the all over except few places where it was not the core location, where these regions showed that uh, um, this, this filamentary structure is quite dynamic. Mm -hmm. And uh, the motions are, uh, by calculating the Mach number, they are supersonic. And by looking at the um, this 13 CO uh, main beam brightness temperature, I found out that uh, around uh, the core, uh, this most massive core, it is the least temperature that I was getting. And then uh, around uh, this core also. Otherwise, uh, it was like, uh, I mean, kind of a, <coughs> Uh, over these two ranges kind of a constant temperature. So uh, with this um, uh, preliminary result, I would like to say that uh, this best kinematics uh, for this particular spine has given a hint that we can, uh, there's a uh, supersonic motion towards this filamentary structure, and there's a velocity gradient along the spine, which may be responsible for the uh, gas accretion toward the center of nebula. And then uh, there's further requirement of, uh, there's a requirement of further more study towards these bipolar regions. So this work is uh, like still going on and I am just looking at all these uh, filamentary structures towards these bipolar nipples. Thank you, thank you, Ita. Is there a question? Yeah, Manoj. Take the, uh, these, uh, <coughs> sir, sir, Mike, the actually the Zoom participants or the online participants cannot hear the voice. Uh, it, uh, it the, uh, go to the conclusion slide where you, uh, you yeah. conclude uh, about supersonic motions. Mm -hmm. So these uh, uh, filaments, uh, they what the, the temperatures are a few tens of Kelvin. Um, dust temperature you are talking? Yeah, for gas temperature, gas temperature. So it's cold. Yes. Yeah, right? yeah, main beam temperature. That yeah, no, I would say that this supersonic thing. So this is known, uh, you know, from the these onwards that the uh, filamentary, the molecular terms, yeah. uh, uh, the, the line widths, they are always supersonic because the sound speed is uh, a kilometer per second or two kilometer per second at those temperatures. But they are not always uh, supersonic. They can be subsonic or transonic motion also, depending on the line width. So, yeah. yeah. But most of the molecular terms are known to be yeah. supersonic and there's a big uh, no debate about the stability of the clouds and all, right? It, because the supersonic uh, motions are displaced. Yes, uh, yes. So, but where the clouds are relatively quiescent, or uh, there the line widths are uh, like, if, for example, for the pre stellar course, where they are more quiescent and peaks at peak. So the line widths, they are not, they come, don't come up in the uh, supersonic motion, even in the filamentary structures, although there are cores. Yeah, but the yeah. sound speed is more of a kilometer per second at uh, 10, 20. Uh -huh, yeah, for, yes, if you take sound speed, uh, yes, that will be uh, supersonic, but uh, mm -hmm. if there are more uh, motions, non thermal motions, then that will be higher. Yeah. Any other question? There are no more questions. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you. So next talk is Alisa has been good. Uh, exploring the radiation technique, inclusion of L160. So clearly, you have.
Hello everyone, I am Siyali Shah, currently a postdoc at SNBOS uh, Kolkata and I am working with uh, Dr. Tapus Bhak there and I would like to thank the organizer for giving me the opportunity to present our work uh, in this platform. So I'll be uh, talking about the exploring uh, the radiation driven implosion in L1616. So this is the overview of my talk. So I will begin with the uh, brief introduction and then I will present the data which we have used in uh, this study. And uh, we basically carried out the magnetic field study in this uh, uh, work and uh, I will show the results uh, in this uh, uh, part. And next, we will uh, point out which is the main uh, source uh, which are uh, which is responsible for the radiation implosion or RDI in uh, L1616. And then I will conclude the uh, talk with a summary. And uh, let us begin with the introduction. So when uh, I'm saying uh, the radiation driven implosion uh, in L1616, so uh, the first question will strike in our mind is what is radiation driven implosion? Well, this is a, a mode of subformation, which is basically induced by the strong uh, radiation em emitting from the massive uh, OB stars, uh, which are basically a mass uh, greater than 8 to 10 uh, solar mass. And uh, the strong uh, radiation and uh, um, the stellar wind in this uh, massive stars, they can, uh, they can either uh, disrupt the surrounding uh, molecular clouds and they can hinder the star formation. And in contrast, they can also uh, uh, induce the star formation uh, in the molecular clouds and thus they uh, uh, help in the formation of uh, triggered uh, star formation. So uh, this figure have taken from Dehelvan 2010 where at the center there is a, a massive star and because of the strong uh, UV photons uh, they are uh, associated with the uh, H2 uh, regions and uh, at the boundary uh, uh, there uh, will be a cold against the molecular clouds. And uh, what happens is, uh, if there is any pre-existing uh, dense uh, uh, clouds, what will happen? At the boundary, a shock front will be generated, and we, uh, which will compress the cloud, and eventually uh, star formation will uh, happen. And uh, as a result, what, uh, as a result, what uh, again uh, will happen is uh, there can be a possibility of existence of uh, elongated type uh, structures, uh, which are pointing, uh, which points towards the. Uh, massive sources. So here I have shown uh, example of uh, two uh, such uh, uh, structures like a bright ring cloud, BRC 37 and BRC 38, and uh, which are like you can see they are uh, like uh, elongated uh, in the, stru uh, uh, the the structure is elongated and they are pointing toward the uh, towards the uh, massive uh, star. And uh, we can also get, get uh, cometary globules and elephant rock nebula uh, uh, like this. And now, uh, magnetic field lines have uh, also play important role in, uh, in the evolution of the cloud and also in the star formation in this uh, class because uh, they support the uh, cloud against its uh, gravitational uh, collapse. So, uh, what happens uh, in the RDI is uh, if there is any uh, uh, perpendicular uh, magnetic field uh, lines uh, in the in the clouds, and uh, what will happen if for the uh, uh, low and uh, weak for the weak and um, uh, medium strength magnetic fields. Uh, for the in, by the influence of these ionizing stars, the magnetic field lines will be uh, pulled away from the direction of ionization, and also uh, it will eventually follow the cloud structure. And for uh, very strong magnetic fields, uh, they will uh, remain in their uh, initial alignment. So. Uh, 
an investigation of the magnetical geometry surrounding the uh, molecular clouds is uh, very much necessary to know uh, its contribution in the dynamical evolution of the cloud and, and the star formation also. And for this, what we have uh, done, we utilize the dust polarization. So these are uh, dust, uh, dust plates are basically aspherical uh, uh, particles, so, uh, and they usually uh, uh, follow. Uh, they usually align with their minor axis parallel to the uh, magnetic field lines. So when the uh, unpolarized dust, uh, uh, unpolarized dust starlight falls on the on these uh, aligned dust grains, we will get a plain polarized uh, uh, light along the direction of the minor axis, which is also direction of magnetic field. Uh, so in the optical NIR, we can get this type of uh, polarization. And uh, along the uh, direction of the ma major axis, we will get the maximum uh, dust thermal emission. So at the end, we will get a plane polarized uh, light along the direction perpendicular to the magnetic field lines. And using this method, uh, we uh, 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 map the magnetic field lines towards uh, this cloud L1616. This is a uh, wise uh, color composite image using uh, wise 3.6 uh, for 4.5 band 12 micron. So this you can see there is a uh, clear uh, uh, cometary like structure uh, in this uh, cloud and it is located at the at the 8 degree OS to the Oran Obi-Wan association. So uh, these are the massive stars present uh, here and uh, uh, and the, there are lot, um, many uh, YSOs present uh, towards uh, this uh, region, which we have found from the literature. And there is a, uh, we have found the, I mean, you know, people have found the small scale sequential star formation, like uh, the older stars are uh, distributed in this region and the younger stars are distributed towards the cloud. So uh, we found uh, this uh, cloud uh, and is uh, uh, as an excellent uh, candidate to study. and. Uh, we are uh, now. I will show the data which we have uh, used, and uh, we have for optical polarization. We have we used uh, uh, M pole attached with 104 centimeters Sampurna telescope from Aries uh, Nainital, and for some millimeter polarization, we have used uh, Planck archival data. And now going to the results part. So uh, here uh, I have shown the uh, optical polarization vectors in the uh, wise color composite image. So uh, the, the yellow vectors are the polarization vectors. The length of the uh, polarization vectors are basically uh, uh, determine the length and the degree of polarization and the uh, angle of this polarization, polarization vectors from the celestial north-south uh, determines the position angle, which also infers the, uh, uh, the direction of magnetic field lines. So from this figure, you can see that the magnetic field lines are uh, very much chaotic. So what we have done, we uh, sub divided this region into 18 by 18 grids, each of five arc minute in uh, uh, size. And, uh, and we took mean of, uh, uh, mean of degree of polarization and position. Uh, so uh, from this figure, uh, we can say that now the polarization vectors are uh, uh, following the uh, cloud structure from the mean uh, polarization results, optical polarization results. And here I have shown, uh, this is Planck 857 gigahertz image. And uh, and the uh, yellow vectors are showing the uh, plan submillimeter submillimeter polarization vectors, and the cyan lines are the optical uh, polarization vectors. And uh, uh, from uh, this uh, and in the edges of the molecule of the molecular cloud, you can see the uh, uh, plan and optical uh, polarization vectors are matching, but in the in the Inside the cloud, it's um, I mean they are um, not uh, correlated uh, at all. So uh, it could, uh, can also be because of the because of the poor resolution of plan. So which are uh, for which it is not able to uh, so uh, show the the uh, small scale uh, randomness. And uh, now uh, and from this figure, you can also say that the 
the magnetic field uh, magnetic field orientation is almost quite perpendicular to the uh, direction of the uh, cloud and uh, but, uh, for the by the influence of the massive uh, ob stars uh, the magnetic field lines uh, are pulled away from the from, from its initial alignment and it is showing the uh, now it is showing the uh, clouds uh, curvature which uh, can be reviewed in optical uh, polarization results but uh, in the plan as the uh, uh, the resolution is uh, poor so we are not able to see such variations in uh, sub millimeter and to compare this uh, randomness uh, what we have done uh, uh, the we have presented the optical and the plank uh, um, the histogram of uh, position angles in optical and plank so here is the optical polarization vectors the um, polarization uh, um, position angles so uh, the white histograms are the position angles uh, before uh, taking the mean and the gray histogram is the position angle after taking the mean so uh, uh, so up, even after taking the mean you can here i have uh, shown that the dispersions of uh, theta which is the position angle before and after taking mean are 49 degree and 38 degree respectively so even after taking the mean so there is a uh, which is highly uh, random but uh, in in uh, plan it is uh, the dispersion in theta phi is uh, 14 degrees so this is much smoother in uh, plan and uh, so now we are going to see uh, which one is the main ionizing source for uh, getting to me yeah uh, rdi in l1616 so this figure i have already shown uh, uh, so there are uh, 10 sources uh, uh, you can uh, see and uh, from the elongation of the of the cloud you can see it is pointing towards uh, these three uh, stars mainly so this is uh, the star one is uh, basically sigma right and it is of spectral type uh, it is main sequence star of o 9.5 b this the star number three is epsilon all right uh, and uh, this is a blue supergiant of b01 uh, a and the star number four is the main sequence star it is of b 2.5 b and we calculated the uh, total pressure of uh, the uh, stars and uh, for epsilon or it is of the order of 10 to the power minus 13 dias per centimeter square which is highest among the other ob stars so by this uh, pressure uh, component we can see that we can uh, say that uh, epsilon or i is the main uh, source of ionization towards uh, this cloud and thus influencing the star formation here and we have take, uh, considered another uh, method so what what we did is we took the ysos located towards this region from literature and we uh, uh, obtained their uh, proper motion from uh, gaia edr3 and then we subtracted the proper motion of those uh, uh, ysos uh, 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 from the uh, proper motion of uh, Okay, we uh, subtracted the proper motion of epsilon or I from the observed proper motion of Gaia, uh, Gaia uh, idea 3 and thus we obtained the relative proper motion of the Y source with respect to the uh, epsilon or I. And in this figure, I have shown the uh, this uh, relative proper motion of the Y source uh, using the yellow arrows you can see and this is the direction of ionization. This line is basically connecting the epsilon or I and the central iris source here. So you can see that the uh, if we uh, assume that the YSOs are kinematically, I mean, the YSOs are forming within the cloud, so they are, uh, they, when we are assuming they are kinematically coupled, so their motion would reflect the motion of the uh, cloud itself. So, uh, as the YSOs are uh, going away from the direction of ionization, and we can, so we can say that the, the, uh, the, the this L1616 uh, is also going away due to the influence of the uh, epsilon array. So, uh, well, uh, this I am going to the summary and conclusion part. So we report the first parametric study uh, uh, towards the L1616 to investigate the, the basically plane, uh, the plane of sky component of magnetic field lines. And we, from the urban imaging polarimetry data, we got a very random optical polarization vectors, but they are uh, following the clouds curvature. Uh, if we take the five, uh, if we take the uh, mean uh, polarization vectors, but in plant polarization, they are showing they are relatively much smoother distribution, and uh, and uh, uh, it also from this study we also uh, 
uh, can say that initially the magnetic field lines are perpendicular uh, in direction and then we uh, because of the influence of epsilon array uh, the ma magnetic field lines are pulled away from the, because of the strong radiation from epsilon array it's, it's a day it has been accepted recently in MN arrays <laughs> Yeah. So your slide where you showed the polarization of optical and plank, uh, you can put that on. You are claiming that uh, in plank because of angular limited angular resolution, mm -hmm. you are missing this change in direction. Mm -hmm. But in this plot, the amount the quantum amount of polarization is showing structure at much smaller scale. Uh, this, uh, so this how region, is that possible? This region. No, this and length are amount. Of, see, length of these lines are the polarization amount, right? In yellow. Ha, 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 yeah. But that is showing structure means variation. Like yeah, smaller because uh, because of the here the column density is uh, higher. So what happens is uh, in the in this high, high column density, the magnetic field, the alignment of the dust grains uh, can be uh, random. So we will get an average. Uh, so polarization vectors will cancel out if it is random. So ultimately, we will get a, a lower degree of polarization for high column density uh, uh, region. And this study has been found in various plank observations um, in literature. So, so, what I mean to measurement of value of polarization is having better resolution. How is that compatible? Okay, achha, uh, the thing is uh, here the optical polarization are uh, uh, of unit length. So here I have taken. Uh, um, I think three percent. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So you said you have used the plant uh, data which has low resolution, right? Mm -hmm. So have you tried uh, using the GCMP data because they have better resolution? Right? Uh, we are planning to put uh, a proposal for that because in plant the resolution is very poor. Another question. You mentioned that the polarization vector of following your cloud region. So because of the cloud's magnetic field, local magnetic field, because they are not parallel with the electromagnetic field. Uh, it's galactic magnetic field. Yeah. So because of the uh, ionization, strong ionizing pressure from the external array. It what is, I, what I mean is, what, what my question is that what makes them a different orientation? What is the mechanism behind that? Usually, magnetic field uh, makes the orientation of this particle, right? In front of that, whatever the particles are there. Uh, yeah. I did not know. Yeah. Okay. What I mean is, what I mean is that uh, usually, you said that the polarization vectors they are following the structure of the cloud. Cloud, uh, cloud audience, uh, yeah, cloud yeah. audience is following. Yeah. Usually, it has to be the parallel to of the electromagnetic magnetic field, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, even so, it is. Yeah, it is in uh, in uh, the blank. Yeah, it is almost at the galactic galactic. Uh, uh, so random, uh, too random. The blank one. No, no, optical one. Yeah, the randomness is revealed in optical. Yeah. That's because of the local magnetic field, I'm saying, or okay. because of the energy it, energy source. Local. Yeah, interesting that uh, yeah. uh, the left panel showing that uh, I think the, it's related to the same question as given us. Uh, in a small region, uh, you are getting vectors uh, in a random direction, right? Huh. So, uh, have you taken care of the edge, uh, the stars which are falling in the edges of the polarimetric field of view? Because we have eight up in the field, huh. aim pole. And then when you do do the reduction, mm. you should be have you taken care or neglected the stars which are falling at the edges? Because uh, by mistake, if we can consider the the stars falling at the edges, mm. then they may have random values because the because there was a kind of overlapping between O and G rays and also non-uniform background. Yeah, I'm just a concern. Okay, uh, during uh. 
we took the uh, the observed the stars are uh, which uh, we observed there mainly at the periphery we have uh, shown i mean in the periphery we have uh, taken those stars for polarization yeah. Uh, that could be the reason. Yeah. Okay. So, if you have no more questions, thank you, Riyadi. Once again, so now we have uh, almost 20 minutes and we we'll start the next lecture. Uh, 335. So Uh, the next session speakers are requesting to give the slides. Uh, How do you just like this? Do you want print or no? So, okay. <laughs> My presentation. Okay, okay, okay. So should I, I can do with this? Uh, we will provide the Zoom link. We can read it from there. Share the screen from the Zoom. I don't think uh, we have that Apple oh, support. No, I can put in pen drive and okay, so, okay. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Pen drive is ah. okay. okay. We want pen drive. Yeah. 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 Or uh, you can put it in this pen drive also. I'm just discussing. Yeah, they have their own pen drive. Oh. <laughs> Yes, uh, which one? Hmm. You wish to see me six months. This one. Uh, yeah, um, just so you have your own book. I have my own book. Yeah, okay, just so. Okay, okay, just a disconnect. Yes, I will be used for something. It is not a problem. Yes. Yeah, we need to connect it. We can check it. No, but this is the screen. Just try. No, no. This is what I'm doing. As a pointer, I'm doing that. Point, I'm doing that. That's true. Yeah. You can use this. You have to use this. Yeah. Uh, this this one is the pointer the top, the top one uh -huh. okay uh, this one is for going forward uh -huh. backward and backward to the below oh, below one okay. 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 this backward forward mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh. Mm -hmm. so this is it. Yeah. 
There is one folder here, star formation doc. Is it this zero, it's it's zero underscore? Is. Oh, okay. okay, I thought it will come first. <laughs> the PDF we can yeah, copy. Both? Yeah. Okay. okay. So the issue PDF you can use. Yeah. So PDF? Yeah, or yeah. you want to check both? PDF is, is, is enough. PDF is fine. Yeah. Can we get stuck somewhere? Uh, no, just point it on the screen. It, will, it should not work. Oh, I see. Otherwise, I can use stick, right? Yeah, you can use the stick on some stick. Yeah, and, but no, the switching like, between the point is up and down, <laughs> front and back. <coughs> yeah. and the only thing is that if the zoom speakers are able to follow the stick. Ah, that's right. Oh, okay, okay. okay. I'll, I'll try to follow this. Yeah, okay. I'll go to the screen and that's my trick. <laughs> that is more efficient, right? Yeah. At least. Uh, so oh, this will this will go work out actually. But oh, okay, it, front it, only. Yeah, 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 yeah front only. I hope I'm presenting after ten years here. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, okay, just let me connect it. It's not PDF, it is a PPT. Okay. NGC? Ready. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah. So this is the pointer. Yeah, this is the pointer. The big one is for going forward. Yeah, and uh, the below one. The... 
बताइए सच्चा ये इसको क्लिक कर दो इसको क्लिक कर दो अच्छा आगे इस बार भी शेयर करें एक और वेलकम बैक टू दिस फोर्थ सेशन is the last session before the new talk so the first talk is by yogi uh, so the topic on tipping into the stand stop formation three of the main generation sarodas sarodas okay so uh, the first talk is so far we have all the talks on you know for galaxy star formation or galaxy so this is the only talk is uh, on extra galactic basically magic cloud is very close by uh but still it is extra galactic so uh what talk okay uh yeah so uh most of the this work is done by my phd uh, student alexander like panchal and this is part of his you know uh, pre phd uh, project work three months so he did did this work and that we converted this into a paper so that was from this and in 2019 so this rx you know uh, no, don't confuse with alexander rx this person he is a local haryana so yeah. <laughs> so uh, yeah magic cloud as you see these are very um, close by uh, dot galaxies we often call them clouds you know they are uh, they are satellite galaxies also you know satellite of on milky way and the very close by normally we cannot see from here i mean we have to go to southern hemisphere to see them because you see the deck is minus 69 and minus 70 for them so mm, we are visible from the southern hemisphere um, through naked eye so we uh, are trying to understand the star formation history of the you know with this Formation uh, triggers star formation burst in this uh, galaxy as a whole. I mean, like uh, you know, see if it can variables are like a star, you know, red giant. There are so many other objects like red dwarf stars. So, so many objects have been used uh, to understand the star formation activity in the magic cloud. So, in this uh, work, we have used uh, see if it very well. उड एंड 
kind of hollow around uh, these two galaxies, and then you have the bridge between the you know uh, the LMC and SMC. So this is the um, recent structure of the Mesonic cloud uh, using the Gaia data. So this is the uh, picture uh, made by the um, uh, using the RLID star, and but we have analyzed the same thing uh, using the secret variable in the in galaxy. Uh, and secret variable, as you see in the typical sort of like curve, and these are very bright objects, you know, typically magnitude, absolute magnitude minus two to minus seven, and their um, period is, you know, quite uh, large, you know, or something like uh, one day to sort of 100, 100 days. So they have large period. So, and this, there is period is relation. So their you know, typical um, age is something like 10 million to 900 million years. So you have a long range of, uh, you know, ages of the Secret variables, and you know these are massive objects. So we can see in front of galaxies like Mesonic Cloud, or even Antarctic Galaxy, we can see these uh, secret quite clearly. So we have used uh, these secret variables because these secret variables are recorded in large numbers by the Ogle Imaging Survey program. So this Ogle group, this open optical depth lensing experiment, uh, they are you know searching for the depth of lensing um, events in the. Me me uh, the galactic bulbs as well as the you know Mesonic cloud. So uh, when um, you do this kind of you know survey program, they uh, they um, release a lot of data and they have uh, found um, you know thousands of variables um, in these galaxies. So recent release of the Ogle that is Ogle four, they have released uh, you know uh, this almost four thousand seven hundred four secrets in LMC and four thousand nine hundred forty five secrets in SMC. So we have used um, this sample of CFID uh, to understand the star for this activity in the Mesonic cloud. As you can see, you know, this Ogle site, I mean, it, um, it gives you various uh, data like CFID, Paralaris, other stuff, LMC, SMC, characters, characters, all this. But uh, recent, just today morning, I uh, checked this website again, and you see that due to coronavirus, this option has stopped completely. So, um, uh, Right now, no options are going on, but I am sure that it will resume very shortly as soon as this is Okay, so we have the goal um, What we did actually now, as I said, there are thousands of secrets, almost if you combine LMC, SMC, altogether, we have almost 10,000 secrets in the, these two galaxies. What we did actually, though, um, we, um, we divided this LMC, LMC in small segments. So, uh, when you divide this um, galaxy in small segments, you have to make it sure that the number of secret in each segments are not too low. Uh, at the same time, you have enough segments, you know, to uh, see the structure in the Mesonic cloud. So what we did here, we have made the, you know, 40 by 45 segments in LMC and, you know, 90 by 90 segments in SMC because, you know, the size of SMC is small and you have large number of secret in SMC. So we have got some 389 segments in LMC and 560 segments in SMC. But later we check that, okay, we need to have at least 10 uh, in each segments, you know, to do some steps analysis. So we found only 136 segments in LMC and 136 segments in SMC where we have, you know, we have to work 10 or more secrets. Because actually um, this work was, you know, done to map the reddening in the LMC SMC. So that was the main work. But Apart from that, when we are doing the setting map, we, um, you know, started to start for this in these two galaxies. So, um, as you see the, now we have the, these um, segments and for each segments, we have the um, uh, CFITs, number of CFITs, and then we have drawn this number of CFIT and which is given in the color coded form. Uh, so you have the distribution of CFIT in LMC and you can see that this, this uh, structure, you can see here, so you no know, um, bar kind of structure, but and the you know optical center is the uh, center. This one, but as you can see here, uh, number of CFD you talk about these are not centered here, and you, it is something like here. Okay, and you can see the you know LMC bar here, and this is you know tilted form. You know this is or bobbed uh, form. So you have twisted uh, structure here, LMC. And similarly, if you go to SMC, you have this kind of structure. That SMC, when you see the SMC in optical, you have the center here. But when we have, um, you know, seen the spatial distribution of CFE uh, in uh, SMC, we found that, you know, most, 
uh, you know, concentration is not at the uh, center, it is slightly off um, center, as you can see here. So we uh, did this, uh, you know, special distribution of the LMC, SMC, and, you know, we uh, realized that, okay, the, you know, center of this, um, uh, uh, CFID variables are not exactly at the center, I and mean, these are not you know, the uh, concentrated on the poor center part of the, you know, uh, these galaxies, but in fact, um, side which of the uh, galaxy. So what we did now, we have the, you know, uh, fundamental both CFIDs and first over to CFIDs. So, um, so really at all, I mean, they gave a, uh, you know, Correlation between these period, period on the first overtone and period in this uh, fundamental, they gave a relation, and we utilize this relation to combine these um, fundamental and first overtone speed. Because as you see, when you have the PL relation for these two kind of speed, you have a different structure here. This is, you know, almost a one by two difference. Uh, here, this top one is a okay, top one is a fundamental mode, PL relation, bottom one is the um. Uh, top one is the first overtone and from, uh, bottom is the fundamental mode um, PL listen. So we wanted to combine them because we wanted to have the age determination of these CFIT and age of the period. And then we need to combine the fundamental uh -huh. mode with the first overtone uh -huh. CFIT. We need to put them on the same level. So what we did, we converted the first overtone periods to fundamental, equivalent uh -huh. fundamental uh -huh. period uh -huh. using this relation. And then we have <coughs> This kind of lesson. So when we have two different set, first over door and fundamental uh, period, so you have this kind of structure. But when we combine them, we have a single PL lesson, as you can see in the right hand side of the picture. So this gave us confidence, okay, we can combine these two because combining these two gives the advantage that we have not larger sample. Uh, so we have something like, um, you know, more than 4,000 C feet. That is fundamental plus first over to the LMC uh, and similar uh, similar number in the SMC. So, if, so our sampling has increased. So what we did after that, we have the you know in one of our previous study we have made the period age lessons for the you know CFID where the, you, we use the CFID in the cluster of the magic cloud and the cluster age are well known and we have the CFID period and then we have made the period age lesson and then we. Uh, uh, got the uh, age uh, period age lesson here, and using this period, we have converted our period of the CFI. Now, when I'm saying CFI, it is fundamental plus first overtone. We combine these two and we get this kind of distribution, is distribution, as you can see here. So this, the top one is the for the LMC, as you see, the you know, we have the various segments and the CFI. In the LMC, a range from 11 to 890 millimeters in our sample of the CV. And similarly, for the SMC, we have a range from 25 to 700 million years. So uh, for LMC, we have you know drawn the uh, distribution, you know, histogram of the age distribution, age distribution of the you know uh, sample as you see here. And we found that okay, the, the peak age of the you know, LMC CVs are 8.2 and log age 8.21. For this SMC, it is 8.68. So these are very close by number. If you see, so within one sigma, they are at one um, log age 8.3. So that is within one sigma, they are very consistent. So what is happening that you know these you know CFIDs uh, are peaked at 830 million years in the LMC as well as SMC. So we concluded that if you see convert this 8.3, it will come around 200 million years. At that time, we have you know major star formation event triggers. In LS, SM, LMC and SMC all together. So this is coincidental that it happened in LMC as well as SMC at the same time. And we interpret that okay, this is a you know some sort of collision encounters between the LMC and SMC. These kind of encounters have been reported in the past also. Like uh, two years in a back, we have these kind of in, uh, encounter between the LMC and SMC. And then 500 million or so also, there was this encounter you know, between the LMC and SMC. So from this um, analysis we found that okay, there is one more encounter at 200 million years between the LMC, which has triggered the star formation is the, in these two galaxies. And this we found consistent with other surveys also using the, you know, uh, like open cluster and, you know, other uh, objects. So, um, and Anpuni and her group has, you know, used um, you know, various objects in this magic cloud, you know, to understand star formation history of the magic cloud, and they also found a similar result. So, 
to me. So what we conclude from, from here that there was a star formation trigger in both the galaxies due to the encounter between these you know, two components of the magic clouds. So uh, the, as I said, the, the, these kind of you know, star formation events have also reported in the past, have been reported in the past, like two, two giga year, 500 million year, and uh, even as recent as 12 million year. So what happens that, okay, LMC and SLC, you know, these um, uh, two satellite galaxies, uh, these clouds, uh, uh, and they, you know, frequently interact with each other, they encounter, and then when there is encounter, then there's really uh, star formation triggers. And in fact, it is believed that the whole amazing cloud has some sort of interaction with the Milky Way also. So the, in, in between this, uh, you know, large magic cloud and small magic cloud, there is this amazing bridge. Uh, you will see, uh, I mean, you must have seen the very first slide of um, this talk. And there is this bridge and you have the LMC and you have SMC. So uh, other studies, I said, they have also reported this kind of, you know, uh, um, observation where 200 million years ago, we have seen, the, you know, a star phone is triggered in the amazing clouds. And then what we did actually, you know, we have this, you know, um, sparsal distribution of this uh, CP accord, but as color coded is the age of the, you know, CP. Again, what we have shown that is in segments. These are the 133 segments for LMC and something 129 segment for SMC. Uh, okay, um, this 694 segment for LMC and 653 segment for SMC. And we have seen, so what we have noticed here that, okay, uh, this, you know, old, old CP um, uh, are, Closer to peripheral region in the both LMC and SMC, and you know, relatively younger secrets are in the, the center part of the um, cloud. So, so what we conclude that okay, star formation is taking place like outward to in quenching formations, where the formation is going on, you know, out of peripheral region, and then it goes inside, and the, that that's why we have the young star for young uh, uh, secret formation in the um, center part of the um, galaxy, and it is same in the both the galaxies. So, as you see here, what we conclude um, here from this, you know, special map of, you know, C field, when we uh, draw them in uh, from age um, as color, so we see that this outside in quenching of the star formation happens in the basin cloud. And distribution of C field is off center, as you can see here. And we have um, seen this again in, uh, in our special distribution of the C field as whole. So this was published, you know, um, and a, this was part of, you know, Alex um, work. So, oh, sorry, what happened? Disconnect it again. So it's no, it was last, last slide, like somebody of the, you know, this one. Actually, okay. Name and you just go to somebody. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, so, to summarize all this work. Okay. 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 So, what we noticed from the you know um, large sample of CFX in LMC and SMC, we have tried to understand you know start for the history of the. Uh, Mesonic cloud, and we found that there is a you know uh, common age where these kind of you know uh, star formation figure happens, and this common um, age distribution in both LMC and SMC that shows that there is the encounter between these two components of the Mesonic cloud, and this because uh, we have limitation that age of the you know secrets are between something like ten million year to nine. Hundred million year, so we cannot trace these you know, star formation even say two giga year ago, or even very young as as young as twelve million year. But at least in this time span, when we have the two hundred million years, we found this star encounter between these two um, galaxies. And other is that okay, we observe that old star are located in the peripheral region of the MC, we suggested an outward in quenching of star formation event, mm -hmm. and the star formation is and. Ongoing process in the basin cloud, but many studies, including present one on certain episode of star formation, I have taken, taken, taken uh, I have you know uh, shown just one star formation trigger in the basin cloud, but there are um, other triggers happened in the basin cloud in the past, and this SFR is significantly higher 
uh, um, during this star formation evolution. Yeah. Next slide, I think. It is not green and green. Thank you very much. I have a Yeah, that the first slide I have shown here, which is not going to work. That was fossil distribution, and all the secrets were taken into account. Yeah. Then, yeah. So that distribution is different from uh, the stellar distribution because your peak was somewhere else in CP distribution, density distribution. Yeah, that's true. So my question is, why should be there a different density distribution for CPI compared to normal stars? This is the first question. And the second question is about your period, uh, period age relationship. Then you derive what is the uncertainty in that? It is given the year. Huh? It is given the year. If you huh? see. Just try to just okay. Again, it is now showing. So I have drawn the. Mm, yeah, I didn't. Uh, call, I didn't get can you can you share? Yeah. Take one second. <coughs> Which one? I will do. Okay, this one. So errors are given here, and uh, typical answer, again, typical uncertainty age is 40 million years for this for equation LHS, yeah, for LHS, LHS. Yeah, that okay, so, uh, uh, so this is one answer. So um, other um, point is that why we see the you know cephids and uh, different place in the optical center. No? So what we call center, that is optical center, what we see, right? So center depends. Suppose if there is a you know pool objects, you know, dense of pool object. So we will see dense pool of some other place. So when we monitor uh, the, any particular region, we have a different, uh, you know, center. So similarly, the hot. We are seeing an optical only, right? This, this is the number of cephidia. But this, an optical wavelength. Right? Yeah, this is optical wavelength. Right? Yeah. So but, but but this is the number of cephidia. Yeah, yeah. So that's the question. Why is there a density distribution uh, difference between okay. the Maybe we can explore. Yeah. yeah. But it is, it is for other you know, objects as well, even cluster, we have you know, different sectors. Yeah. Yeah. So, how do you compare these results with the, with the other uh, studies, uh, such as Red Club studies done by Adaboni and Yeah, they have actually done, done a lot of work. In fact, in Magic Clouds, uh, Red Club Star, you know, uh, other Ogle survey, and they have used Ogle P survey. And, and so, there, um, the star for this figure they have reported from 100 to 300 million years, and even other studies have reported in this range. So we we are very close to all these studies, 200 million years, but even in recent uh, studies it is reported around 200 million years. So this study is well with uh, their study. In fact, they uh, in, because they have used different kind of object in uh, one of the um, object, uh, one of the study by. Uh, her student Smitha says reported one more uh, trigger at around say 10 20 uh, million years. So, as I said, these kind of triggers keep on happening when we have a um, magic cloud infection. Uh, so, whenever there is encounter, you will see suddenly you know epoch of the start for this activity in these uh, clouds. So, they have also reported. Uh, this in the cloud we showed there seems to be like asymmetry in the age distribution of the trees in SMC. I guess that means like that uh, we, uh, we can see distinct population there. We can see distinct population. Are we talking about distinct population of the trees there? Yes, yes, yes. Because that was noticed in SMC. Right? And I, I don't think, have you addressed that in the slide? You are talking about uh, 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 no no here here right? Okay, other distribution plot. Okay, this is the So you are saying that when we draw the age distribution, yeah. So what we have to account for? So no, we have not count for because this is a simple age distribution of the SMC series. Similarly, is this is not the SMC series. So we have taken them total in total, and then we check what is the you know maximum age.
when we are getting the peak. So that peak gives you some idea. It doesn't mean that if there is star formation triggers happens at 200 million years ago, star formation will not take less 100 million years or 300 million years. As I have shown that it is an ongoing process. But these are the places where you have sudden first, sudden almost of star formation. Another question, question. Yeah. Why you need to convert your from the fundamental to faster water? So to increase the sample of CP, because when you do this kind of study, you know, you need large sample of yeah. CP. Because yeah. if you have lesser number of secrets, well, how as I say, if I take this fundamental mode, for example, yeah. so you will have either less number of CV per per segments, which you, you can you cannot analyze the data because you know these secrets are used to drive the period luminosity lesson, and from that period luminosity lesson, we have determined the reddening of that segment. You need certain number of you know, uh, objects sure. in that year lesson to, to draw the diagram. Uh, Next topic by Shulis, we will be talking on, on the morphology of the energetic of magnetic fields across the space of Taurus G231 region. Yeah, uh, myself is Ray Charmi. Uh, I'm a Ramarajan Fellow at Daisa Dirpati. I thank the organizers for this opportunity to present my recent work. Uh, that is uh, uh, based on the multivalent polarized conservations towards the Taurus V2 integration. I will be mainly focusing on the magnetic field orientation and the corresponding role in the formation and evolution of the, the dense cores. Um, so, this work is actually a part of large collaboration, uh, distro, uh, or distro collaboration, and mainly uh, uh, the collaborators are span over uh, China, Taiwan, uh, South Korea, Japan, and USA. And of course in India. Yeah, so this is the brief outline of my talk. Uh, so mainly I will be focusing on the results, uh, results based on magnetic field orientation, the low mass dense cores, uh, which are entirely uh, free from stellar feedback. And I uh, conclude my talk with summary. So if time permits, I'll, I'll uh, show some results on the ongoing research. Um, so this is the main motivation behind my work, uh, so which comes from two uh, uh, broad questions that uh, how the material actually uh, you know get accumulated from low density uh, uh, regions with density of uh, one particle per centimeter cube to the dense clouds which have the densities greater than ten to the power of four per centimeter cube. So this is a vast range in the densities and also in the spatial scales from tens of parts to a uh, few parts scales. And by looking at this, uh, you know, uh, this image, which comes from the, uh, the Herschel uh, um, uh, composite image, you can see that uh, most of the like, entire cloud, you can see in terms of elongated elementary structure. Yeah, so he has a bright emission, which is actually a span over tens of part six K. And in addition, you can also see that uh, there are very low density uh, stations, which actually supply material from this larger scale to smaller scale filamentary structures. And this is one thing. And the another, another thing is that this entire filament can be uh, further fragmented into uh, dense small cores. And then this dense cores can uh, collapse further to form the protostars. You can see that uh, the uh, one-to-one the -one correlation between the dense cores and the filamentary elongations. So it indicates that there is a direct uh, relation between the multiple clouds, filaments, cores, and stars. And the high resolution recent observations also you can see that the protostellar disks are, are well resolved, and these are the, the, the locations where the planets can form in the later stage. And uh, so, in order to uh, shed some light on how these clouds actually uh, get accumulated and then form the filaments, we should look at the observational signatures. Uh, so, first thing is that uh, when we look at the molecular line observations, uh, C1, Tactile C1, you can see that. Uh, you can see a signature for the red shifted components and then uh, uh, blue shifted uh, velocity components. So this is corresponding to the accretion flows, uh, which are actually coming from large scale to uh, uh, large scales, and then they're converging and then form a, forming a elongated filamentary like structure. Um, so these are, uh, you can see that this is also uh, 
the same thing, but it's a kind of schematic diagram, which is indicating that there is a, a red flows and a red shifted flows and the blue shifted flows. They are mentioned at a certain location to form a yellow meter field material structure. But is there any other factor that can support these uh, material flows? Yes, you can see that the magnetic field orientation, these segments. Um, so these CN vectors are from NIR polarimetry, and the red segments are uh, red segments are from optical polarimetry. You can see that uh, the elongated filamentary structure is uh, preferentially oriented in the perpendicular direction to the uh, overall magnetic field structure. So these two, um, uh, I think, diagrams can indicate that uh, magnetic field essentially can can support the material flows from large scale and small scales. They act like a uh, kind of uh, tubes. And um, um, yeah, so this recent um, uh, 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 surveys have actually come up with uh, two steps transformation process. So here, the turbulence and magnetic fields. Uh, I think I can choose the stick. So uh, the turbulence and magnetic fields actually uh, they collaborate with each other, and then uh, this turbulence can actually, you know, supersonic in the large scale. They can actually sweep up the material. So, uh, so that is something something similar to the you know when we sweep up the ground, so we can actually you can see the accumulation of material. So if you have a two converging flows, large supersonic flows, there is an accumulation of material, and then magnetic fields actually funnel the material. Just magnetic fields will tell the material that just flow along the magnetic field, just flow flow along the field line, but not across the field lines. So that's why we can see a kind of uh, perpendicular configuration most of the observations. Uh, this is one thing. And then when these uh, dense uh, structures will form, gravity will come into play. And then this dense force will further uh, fragment, into, fragment into dense force and they further collapse to form the stars. And uh, so as I introduce here, uh, turbulence, magnetic fields, and gravity, these are the very three important factors. But they actually, uh, they won't act independently. They collaborate with each other. So this is one of the very good diagram that I really like. Uh, I think that is very informative. Uh, that the magnetic fields, turbulence, and gravity, uh, this, all these factors can collaborate with each other. You can see that magnetic fields and turbulence can also interact with each other. And then, uh, you know, for example, if the magnetic fields are very strong, turbulence can be channelized along the magnetic lines. In such a case, you see a Kind of filaments will be parallel to the magnetic field lines. And then gravity, if the gravity is uh, more, not more dominant in comparison to magnetic field lines, you will get a kind of gravitational compression will take along the field lines. Right? Then you will get a perpendicular configuration. In addition, gravity and turbulence can also interact with each other. So, as uh, when and there is a kind of significant contribution from these three factors, you can see that. This uh, kind of the star formation efficiency can be can be reduced uh, to uh, observe the uh, you know level. So if we have only the gravity contribution as one with the red diagram, you can see that the star formation rate could be in, uh, could have been very very high, like uh, thousands and hundreds of stars form each year. As soon as we introduce uh, turbulence, you can see that the star formation rate has been reduced and the lifetime of the cloud will be uh, will be enhanced and. Uh, <clears throat> We need protostellar outflows because the turbulence can decay in three, four times. So we, we have to replenish the turbulence in the form of uh, protostellar jets and uh, supernova explosions, etc. And then we have, when we have the all the co three components, and then there is a jets contribution, then uh, you can see that the molecular clouds can live longer, and the star formation rate could be can be uh, drastically reduced. And uh, and here you can see that the gravity and turbulence we can quantify much more easily than the magnetic field lines because if we have ground density map, we can actually quantify the ground density and then gravity. And if we have a multiple line observations, we can quantify the turbulence. But uh, you can see that as for all the existing observations are very confined to small patches of the skies. And it's very hard to trace the magnetic field lines because the required observing time will be substantially high in comparison to the intensity observations. For example, for the photometric observations towards some region, we generally need uh, less than one hour. But to trace the magnetic field lines, at least we need four times of the data, uh, four times of the exposed time. Um, generally, we use the dust pollution uh, observations. Uh, 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 to, to, to delay the magnetic field orientation. So the, the mechanism actually goes like this. If you have an unpolarized light, which is coming from the distant uh, stars, when this light encounters the elongated dust lines, one of the light will be uh, precisely extended, this component, because it encounters, it encounters maximum absorption cross section. 
in comparison to the another component, the blue component. So because of this dichroic extension, uh, the uh, the received light will be linearly polarized. So uh, these two important factors we can actually get from these observations. One is the degree of polarization that essentially will help understanding the dust properties because these are the main factors creating the uh, producing the polarization. And also the direction will then use the direction of the polarization will tell about the magnetic field orientation on the plane of this guy. Yeah. Um, um, and general observations that says that the large scale magnetic fields are very well ordered and they are precisely perpendicular to each other. You can see that these all the observations are come from the plant because the plant has low resolution. We, can, we cannot probe the magnetic fields at the smaller scales. Um, so there comes the importance of uh, you know, sublimeter observations. So according to the simulations, if we have a, a strong magnetic fields across the larger scale to smaller scales, you can see that the order magnetic field lines, as soon as we see the vicinity of the protostars, so it will actually exhibit a uh, how blush uh, magnetic field structure because of the ambifolarization process. This is the case uh, in, if you have a strong magnetic field lines. But what if you have uh, uh, other factors? For example, if you have a gravity driven flows, then actually this gravity can drive the uh, full the magnetic fields from perpendicular configuration to parallel configuration. This results has been published in Nature Astronomy. And in one of our results, our work, we witness a kind of compression magnetic fields in the, in the vicinity of these two regions. And also, uh, the alpha observations, if we go uh, and see the magnetic fields of the vicinity of the protostars outflows, you can see that the magnetic fields can be entirely disrupted. And uh, if we have a strong magnetic field also, that will also, you know, uh, uh, kind of, uh, can, it, uh, it can, these all factors can, uh, can uh, make the magnetic fields diverge from the uh, coherency. Um, but in order to study the real importance of magnetic fields, we need to actually probe the pristine conditions. Pristine conditions means that, uh, means that the region, whatever we study, should be entirely free from the stellar feedback. One such region is the Starus Big One region. You can see that the large scale magnetic fields are very precisely ordered. They are going from the top left to bottom, left to bottom right, and the, the, they are precisely perpendicular to the filament. But this is where we are actually interested because. This region is very, very uh, um, kind of, uh, not very bright, and uh, previous existing observations are not able to, you know, probe the magnetic field lines towards this uh, interesting region. We have conducted very sensitive polarization observations towards JCMT, scuba to uh, scuba to photo, which is actually have contentions with the uh, previous instrument. So, uh, and uh, these uh, observations have uh, are taken from JCMT, as I explained. These observations are part of uh, B fields in star form regional observations, distro program. And uh, these are the main results. You can see that the, the filament was very poisonous. You can see that uh, the, this white vector uh, you know, traces the filament uh, orientation. And this filament has been fragmented into several dense cores. You can see that among these various cores, two dense cores are brighter. And we actually detect a significantly large number of vectors in two bright cores, actually. I'd like to highlight more on these two cores because the rest of the cores, we have only limited segments. And you can see one thing you can share, you see that one core, the magnetic field is in this way, and the other core is entirely twisted by 90 degrees. And I'd like to highlight that these two stars are the uh, progenitors of uh, you know, sun-like star. And they are class zero, class one stars. And their mass is similar, they are at the similar evolution stage. I can say that these two cores are twin cores, but even being twin cores, they form from the same parental cloud and they actually uh, embedded or surrounded by uniform magnetic field lines. Their magnetic field structure is different. You can see that when I plot the larger scale here and the small scale with the red segments, you can see that one core only remembers the large scale magnetic field, but not the, the other core. Um, when we look at the other energetics like magnetic fields, uh, number mass to flux ratio, uh, we also see that both magnetic fields, turbulence, gravity, all these parameters are, are, are same. They are at the EP partition. And uh, we question that why this, why this magnetic field is uh, different in these two cores, even though know, they are the twin stars, uh, twin protostellar uh, cores. And when we look at the, uh, the velocity information, you can see that the velocity gradient has shown with the, uh, the black segments are different. In this one is the uniform velocity. The gas is moving in uniform kind of, kind of configuration, which is corresponding to the rotational kind of motion. But in the another part, you can see that there are two converging flows and they're colliding with each other and then you know, forming a core. So that's where the magnetic field has been tested. Uh, so, uh, 
And these uh, converging flows are actually coming from larger scales, but in one core, they are not uh, actually modifying the magnetic field, but in the other core, uh, they are somehow modifying. Yeah, um, so uh, this kind of accretion flows can actually modify the magnetic field because the whatever the core, whatever the filament we are seeing is actually uh, resulted from the kind of collision material and the fragmentation of the filament into several uh, kind of thin filaments. And then they, they, when they merge, they actually form a kind of dense filament and then uh, it fragments into other cores. In um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So this, this, this work has been uh, uh, abused. Uh, because it, it was the kind of first time that we proved uh, that much deeper. Uh, this is the summary. Uh, magnetic fields are, uh, are very important in the coalescent environments, despite the important role of magnetic fields in the larger scales, but they may not be important at the smaller scales. So we should be careful and we should be, uh, we should look at the gas kinematics. Uh, and also extensive multi observations are equally important uh, to study how the magnetic field varies from large scale to small scale. And this optical uh, NIR polarimetry instrumentation is also very important in the future. And uh, equally, uh, EAO collaboration, uh, for example, to use JCMT would be uh, highly important. And other studies, uh, my student poster you can visit. Uh, uh, he is studying the dust properties uh, uh, as a function of uh, Hi, distance and the magnetic field. Um, Thank you, Ishuk. Uh, I'll make one question. Okay, let's go ahead. Uh, so, in one of your first slides, you talk about transverse uh, velocity so flows into the filaments, right? So, uh, do you have any idea, like, uh, what is the transverse flow rate as compared to say the longitudinal gas flow around filaments? Uh, that I really don't know. Yeah. So uh, what is the transverse flow rate like? The velocity, the kind of uh, the velocity gradient. Uh, so what is the gradient and the flow rate if you have defined? Ah, the attrition rate. I think you are asking. Yeah, I don't have. Uh, I have a question for the conclusions. Uh, I'm a little surprised you say magnetic fields are important in the, at the large scale, but not very important at the small scale. Yeah, I'm not saying but, uh, uh, not important. Yeah, <laughs> probably you should define what those scales are because at the uh, uh, star, central protostar, this mm -hmm. scales magnetic fields are very important. I mean, outflows are driven by their magnetocentrifugally driven. I mean, so. So probably you mean uh, the large scale here, you mean several tens of parsecs. No, above, above a few parsecs. And then small yes. scale? Small scale is less than one parsec, point one parsec. Yeah. Point one, I can yeah, see yeah, actually the scale. Because certainly in smaller scales, it's uh, important. Yeah, yeah important, but like, like other kind of magnetic is also equally important. So, so what I mean is that in this scale, launching of outflow is yes. all bigger than I have seen. No, 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 no. There is the non uh, non MHDF episode. Um, yeah, I think we can discuss more on that. Uh, so when you, you jet, introduce the jets are uh, all like non MHDF, uh, yeah, yeah, if you have yeah. non MHDF, I think that will alter the uh, kind of uh, because this flux phasing will not be valid at the small scales. So maybe we'll discuss more on that. Next talk, uh, we'll be talking near infrared spectroscopy of RBT. Sure. Hello? Yeah. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. I'm Sridhar Baskar, my second year thesis called working in Dr. Jason Matthew at Christ University. Today, I'll be talking about the near infrared spectroscopy study of herbic stars that we have uh, started. So, so, first, what are herbic stars? Okay.
magnetic field truncates the disk at some radius and it starts funneling the material through the disk to the star. So that's what happens in a classical digital star. But uh, magnetic send measures of uh, Herbigaby stars are in order of like 0.1 kilobars or less than that. Yeah. And uh, so uh, so that's the observed limit. So can they observe, can they also have some magnetic accretion limit? Yeah. So we theoretical calculation show that. It is possible for some at least late type Herbig AE stars so that the, the magnetic accretion is possible. And uh, the magnetic accretion scenario in late Herbig AB stars has been successfully applied by Mendigutti and Alam to uh, estimate the Herbigation rates. But uh, when you go to like early Herbig AB stars, the convective layer is not present. So the magnetic field is already less. So we can't expect them to follow the same magnetic accretion paradigm. And uh, even the many other works also point to that the accretion mode is different for early Herbig B stars compared to like Herbig A and classical people. Then uh, I'll just explain with the cartoon. So here the yeah, so in the top thing, this is based on the stellar uh, spectral type. So in this is the cladical D of star, you see the uh, strong magnetic field which is accreting a, at a larger distance from the disk and it's fine. Then uh, when we come to like a herbic or intermediate mass zero stars, the magnetic field still reduces. So the distance from it accretes also decreases. And when it comes to like early beam stars, the magnetic field is less. So the this directly meets the star and which is known as the boundary layer accretion. So it's like there are many indications that the mode of accretion changes for uh, from like magnetic accretion for herbic AB and late herbic B stars from boundary layer to the early uh, herbic B stars. Yeah, so what is the motivation for this study? We uh, like now know that the uh, hydrogen line emission can have like multiple components in the spectrum. So one is from the gas circulation disk, magnetic impulse, and the same is even disk wind can be. So these are the questions that we started with. So, so like the presence of bracket series lines is, is it based on stellar parameters? And we started a KSB recombination analysis using bracket line strengths to determine what is the physical uh, properties of the medium. And uh, finally, like how is the mode of operation causing a change in the bracket line features or the near infrared line features? And how do they compare with Balmer and Passion series? Yeah, so uh, the data we are using is, uh, we are, we are you using VLT X shooter and the STS is Apogee. And we are, for the list of well-studied VKP stars, we are using uh, VO 2018, that is hidden. Uh, they have estimates, lab parameters, and mass equation rate homogeneous using the idea. So uh, for the spectra, we are on 39 stars and uh, uh, the X shooter has some 66 stars. Uh, the difference is like uh, SDSS has only H band spectra, like 1.5, 1.7 micron, but it has a very good resolution. Whereas uh, X shooter has uh, 3000 to 25,000 uh, big uh, wavelength window, uh, but the resolution is like moderately high. So yeah, this is one of the uh, Apogee uh, H band spectra where we can see uh, many F2 emission metallic lines and for the bracket emission lines clearly, so bracket 11 all the way up to bracket 20. But uh, when we go to X shooter spectra, uh, all the lines that you expect from uh, Herbig stars can be seen there. Starting from the bracket gamma, the higher order bracket lines, passion beta, passion alpha, and uh, like some higher order passion lines, which is blended with calcium, calcium triplet and uh, O1 lines. Then we can see, even see a uh, forbidden uh, 01630, which is indicative of uh, this wind, uh, wind or something. And we can see even Fe2 emission lines in emission followed by all H beta, H gamma, all the way higher outer boundary lines. So the first step into like, uh, this work, we, we visually checked if the bracket lines, bracket 11 to bracket 20 particularly are seen in emission or not. Then we took them and see if there's any correlation, the present correlation with the Stellar parameters, and this is what you observe. So, what is happening here is like the bracket emission. This is blue is uh, stars with bracket 11 to bracket 20 emission, orange is without. So, you can see that there is some kind of mass limit, like statistically, that higher more than like uh, three solar masses and less than three million old stars are predominantly showing bracket emission, and uh, and again, the hotter stars, like T effective more than 9,000, which is like greater than A0 or something, is showing bracket emission. And also, all the bracket emission series stars 
have um, like higher infrarexes, which is seen by H minus K here. So one of the things that we miss in the early thing is uh, like we miss the filled in black dimension that can come from the H shorter spectra. So that we are tackling by we'll use a model uh, temp model spectra to fit the uh, bracket lines and then see if there is any filled in component present for the bracket emission, which will like a kind of change these plots, but this is the general idea. So there is some kind of trend that is with these color parameters. Yeah, then we move on to the KSB reconversion analysis. Uh, what is KSB? KSB approximation is like where the Lyman the media is like optically thick to Lyman lines, but all other lines are optically thin. So Hammer and Story, they have provided the line intensities for these temperature and electron density ranges. And uh, when it comes to Herbig stars, not much work has been done, especially with the near infrared uh, determined studies or like line ratio analysis. Here, this is for a, a, a T-Tori star where they use the uh, bracket line ratios and uh, model the uh, temperature which can come from. So if we go to the Herbig stars. Um, so basically the work that uh, identifies the emission region of uh, um, bracket lines is this uh, Eisner et al. and Krauss et al. They use from infrared interferometric observation. They see that bracket emission is coming from a compact region inside the dust sublimation radius. So, and they say that uh, bracket dumb emission is from like less than 0 0.05 AU and the temperature emitting region is 2000 to 4000 Kelvin. And uh, then we fitted the uh, uh, equivalent width with the uh, KSB recombination analysis after the photospheric equivalent the absorption correction. And the wavelength, the temperatures we got are like around 3000 to 2000, which is like, which is what they have observed. So this is showing a good uh, 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 first study to see that we can actually measure the temperature values. And we extruded at a high resolution, right? So we can make use to uh, analyze the profiles of uh, all the uh, bash, uh, bash, uh, sorry, all the H1 line series. Uh, yeah, here when we look at the extruded spectra from the whole wavelength range, we can see that there are multiple kind of profiles seen in like the different uh, emission lines. So, for example, you can we can take this. Uh, PDA 69, which is a B6 pointed milliroad star. And uh, here I have given the bracket gamma, bracket 14, and passion beta lines. Here we can see there are like single peak emission with like a slight asymmetry is also seen. But when we go into um, optical, like we see that H alpha is like having a, a asymmetrical double peak structure, and calcium triplets also show asymmetric double peak structures, and uh, O1 8046 line again shows a uh, asymmetric substructure in internet. And uh, so if, if, if we see an asymmetric double peak structure, we can directly indicate that the emission is coming from the disk. So that one part is coming towards you and the other part is receding. So that forms a double peak like a split structure. Now, again, you note that here the VH alpha is like different. The violet peak is less than uh, red peak. But when it goes to H beta, that inverts like so. Here the violet peak becomes intense and the red peak is less. And we can see the HB, H gamma, H delta being completely in um, like P signal profile, inverse P signal profile, which is indicative of infalling matter. And this is not only seen in the uh, bluer end, but we also see in like a helium 10, 10 8, 30 line, which is like again a clear indication of like hard gas infalling. Yeah, so uh, do, can we try to like deep blend these lines and See what is the different strength of line regions. Yeah, it must should be possible by like these are the various models that uh, the literature has. So for disk modeling, you can reuse radiative models, magnet sphere, uh, the they are model the uh, in uh, the profiles that we should get, and disk when like standard models are given. And a few people have attempted the um, the mod the profile modeling of few stars, but they usually focus on either one part of the wavelength region. And, uh, but here we attempt to model these uh, spectra by taking the entire wavelength range from bracket gamma to balma to see how the profile varies. Yeah, this is the summary of uh, all the observation. So we are planning to take more uh, like spectra using TANSPEC and IRTF to get the uh, entire wavelength region and we can perform uh, more like uh, even include passion studies to 
uh, for the combination analysis to see what is the medium coming from. And uh, yeah, the, we'll try to like deep learn the HRF profile to see what is the different ideas. And yeah, thank you. Questions? Uh, nice work. Uh, just wanted to clarify. So you said you have double peak uh, lines as well as the PCT profile. Yeah. Right. So what is the difference between the mechanism? Uh, so what we are thinking is, uh, so there are two different emission regions in play. So one is like the single peak Gaussian emission, which is which is why you get this broad peak. But uh, on that, there's a superimposed PCT profile. So that is causing the double peak structure. So this is so if we can somehow like model this using these h gamma and h delta and like scale it to h alpha's uh, uh, intensity and subtract it from that we'll get like two different uh, intensities like that coming from different regions so that's what we can we will be trying okay so it's so for the same star you are talking here basically yeah, yeah all same star the previous uh, yeah yeah all three like three different things from the same star pds 69 oh yeah we have like more stars like this is showing like different oh, profiles. Okay, that's so, regarding that helium two lines indicating hot gas. Mm, helium yes. one, temp yeah. Yeah. Huh. So bracket uh, speech not how compared to other lines, other students like helium and other hydrogen lines. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but this is like a fault line which is usually seen in equation. They use this to trace the equation rates also. Why do you expect a magnetic field in A, B, Sorry? Why do you expect a magnetic field in Arabic stars? Especially if you are in the early type stars. Yeah, usually that's what the early B stars, they, are, they might not be there. Uh, in, uh, in late A type stars, they might start coming, but it'll be weaker compared to the classical B stars. But still, like it might be enough for it to matter square click, uh, like uh, do the equation through magnetosphere. Thank you. 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 Thank Mr. NG Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I am Sadhna Singh. I am working under Dr. Jigitsan Pandey. Today, I will be presenting my work on polarization, polarizing efficiency, and grain alignment towards the direction of the cluster and the seat of the full So this is the uh, region of the cluster NGC 1345, which, uh, uh, which lies at galactic longitude 226 and galactic latitude at minus uh, 2.0 degree. Uh, so uh, here I am working mainly on the interstellar medium polarization. So the first information about the interstellar medium polarization was given by Hitler and Hall in 1949. They have presented three as observational aspects. That is, first one is the uh, correlation of polarization with reddening. Second is the parallelism of polarization vectors. And third is the uh, variation of polarization with reddening. So based on these three findings, it was uh, concluded that the polarization which we are getting in the interstellar medium is due to the ISM dust grains. So uh, 
if a beam of unpolarized light which is transmitted through a dusty medium uh, how will become a partially plane polarized so there should be two conditions which will be satisfied that first one is that there should be optically anisotropy in the individual dust particles and the second one is that there should be a net alignment of axis of anisotropy so that there should be no randomization effect so overall the picture which arises is like that so the dust grain orientation in the industrial medium is such that the short axis of grains is parallel to the magnetic field. So the light which are coming from here uh, will get the differentially extended and here we will get the polarized light. So the most likely the grain orientation uh, in the industrial medium is such that the short axis is parallel to the magnetic field. However, if there are different uh, alignment theories. Uh, the most uh, uh, accepted alignment theory is the radiative alignment torque, which says that the align most uh, in majority of environment of ISM, the grain orientation will be a magnetic orientation. However, if there is a uh, illumin light illuminating source nearby, then the grain orientation can be different from the magnetic field, and the direction of alignment will be the radiation direction. So overall, we can see that the dichroic extension of a starlight by aligned asymmetric dust grains in the interstellar medium is the main source of interstellar polarization. So the light interacted with the dust grains which are aligned in the interstellar medium. So the information which we can extract from the polarization study are these, that is the properties of ISM dust grains, that is their shape, size and alignment, and the geometry of magnetic field in that region, and how efficient the grain alignment is in the region, and also the foreground dust concentration can be known from the polarimetric study. We have chosen open star clusters to study the uh, ISM dust grains. So we have observed this cluster uh, using image imaging polarimeter M4, which is mounted as a backend instrument of 104 centimeter telescope of a reach. So this is the optical layout of uh, M4. Here is the halfway plate and this is Wollaston prism. So halfway plate is rotatable and we have observed the cluster at four positions of halfway plate, 0, 22.5, 45 and 67.5 degree from the celestial north-south direction. And through the Wollaston prism, each image is transformed into two images, ordinary and extraordinary images, which are focused on the main detector. So the detector used to watch 1K by 1K CCD having pixel size 24 micron and active field of view of 8 arc minute in diameter. For calibration purpose, we have also observed some polarized standard and unpolarized standard stars. And the observations were taken in four bands B, B, R, and I. Uh, we have used the image reduction and analysis facility for uh, determining the aperture, for doing the aperture photometry and determining the flux of ordinary IO and extraordinary images IE. So uh, by using this formula, uh, we have calculated the degree of polarization P and the polarization position again theta. And uh, we have corrected uh, for all the stars for instrumental polarization and zero point polarization position again using the unpolarized and uh, polarized standard star. So in all bands, we have found that the instrumental polarization was less than 0.3% in all the four bands. Here is the uh, distribution of polarization and position angle, uh, uh, which we have observed in the, uh, we, we have observed around 197 stars in the region of cluster and this is 2345. This is, this is the main region and this is the field region, which are around one degree away from the center of the cluster. So the density distribution along with the normalized histogram uh, for P and theta in all the four bands are shown here. And this is the sky projection of polarization vectors. So here the length shows the degree of polarization and the, their tilt shows the, uh, uh, the position angle which was measured from north increasing towards east. And this uh, dotted line shows the uh, projection of uh, orientation of galactic magnetic field at, uh, at this region. So here we have seen that majority of polarization vectors were parallel to the galactic magnetic field. So this shows that the alignment in the region is the magnetic alignment. Uh, the distribution of polarization with distance is important to know about the foreground dust concentration. 
and also if the dust is um, uniformly aligned in along a direction, then polarization should increase with distance. But generally, it was found that dust is located mostly in layers. So the uh, number of layers can be uh, can be seen by seeing the polarization versus distance plot. So the uh, we have seen that the near the distance of around 1.2 kbc, the polarization uh, found to be uh, there is an increment in the polarization at this distance. However, in order to confirm this, we have plotted as the uh, extension also uh, as the dust density contribute to extension also. So we have plotted here extension versus distance plot. Uh, so here also we have seen that there is an increment at around 1.2 kpc distance. Here green, uh, green markers are, so, are showing the bin data at 0.6 kpc distance. So uh, based on this, we can uh, see that the dust layer seems to present near the distance of 1.2 kpc towards the direction of the cluster and this is 2, 3, 4, 5. Uh, wavelength dependence of interstellar polarization follows the uh, relation which was given by Sarkozy in 1975, where P lambda is the uh, polarization at wavelength lambda, and P max is maximum polarization, and lambda max is the uh, wavelength corresponding to which we are getting maximum polarization. So we have fitted this relation for all the stars uh, because we have taken the data in four bands, so, so we have fitted this relation. And so uh, we have the criteria for ice and polarization is well represented by sigma 1. Sigma 1 is the unit weight error of it, which quantifies the departure of our data from the above relation. So a higher value of sigma 1 shows that the star may be intrinsically polarized. So we have taken the uh, value of sigma 1 around 1.6. If the sigma 1 is greater than 1.6, that, that shows the uh, presence of intrinsic polarization in that star. And if this value is less than 1.6, that shows the interstellar polarization. So we have excluded all the intensively polarized star based on sigma 1 criteria and found the average value of lambda max and p max at 0.58 micron and 1.55 percentage. This is the non this is the normalized plot for NDC 2345, PYP max and lambda max by lambda. And this blue curve shows the Sarkovsky relation for the general ISM. Uh, for the general diffuse ISM, the value of lambda max was found to be around 0.55 micron. So the nearby value of lambda max in our region shows that the size as the lambda max it tells about the size distribution of dust grains. So we can say that the size distribution of dust grain towards the line of sight of cluster uh, NGC 2345 is similar to that of the general ISM. And we have uh, found that majority of stars were uh, uh, found to be interest, uh, interstellar. Uh, they have the interstellar polarization. And very few of them were intensively polarized. So the polarizing efficiency is defined as the maximum polarization produced by a given amount of extension. That is Pmax. It is defined by Pmax by AB. So here is the polarizing efficiency diagram. So in this, uh, the uh, Black line shows the upper limit on polarizing efficiency, for, which was given by this relation, and the blue curve shows the average efficiency, which was estimated by uh, the, in this paper. So we have found that the only only the intrinsically polarized stars were above the maximum efficiency line. Otherwise, all the stars are lying below the efficiency line, and the polarizing efficiency found to be close to the average efficiency that was calculated for our galaxy based on the uh, reddening value. And uh, a number of studies have also found that the polarizing efficiency with extinction follows the power law relation which have this. So we have uh, fitted the power law for our region and we have found the power law slope of around minus of uh, minus 0 0.67. So a higher value of slope shows the lesser alignment efficiency in that region which occurs um, mainly at larger uh, extinction region. So here is the variation of lambda max with radial distance. So uh, to inside the core, uh, the core radius of the cluster was around four arc minutes. So inside the core radius, we have found the lambda max was uh, um, increased from center to the uh, core radius of the cluster. And additionally, we have also found that the efficiency means the polarizing P max by AB was also found a higher near the center of the cluster. So they, they shows that they, there is a larger 
there is an increase in the local radiation field of due to stars in the cluster that increases the alignment efficiency of the smaller grains. The value of random X shows the size of the uh, grain, aligned grains. And here is the variation of lambda max with polarizing efficiency. So if we um, don't see, if we exclude the intrinsically polarized stars, then we have found a, um, we have found that with the increase in alignment efficiency or polarizing efficiency, the lambda max decreases. So this could be because if the alignment efficiency increases, that means the uh, smaller grains also get aligned. So the average size of aligned grains shift towards the smaller. So that's why lambda mass decreases. So these uh, are the effects which are uh, which support the alignment, which uh, is due to the radiative torque alignment mechanism. Uh, so here I have shown the uh, these are the cluster. Uh, basically, I'm studying the clusters in the galactic entry center direction, mean the galactic longitude from 90 to 270 and galactic latitude. Uh, plus minus 15. These are the clusters which are previously studied and these are four um, black markers shows the cluster which we are studying or um, which we have studied. So here we have uh, shown the variation of polarization uh, in galactic longitude and latitude. So these are the clusters which are uh, we have taken data from these papers and these are the four our clusters. So in the galactic disk, there is a larger polarization while for LE7 and NGC187, 1817, we have found lower value of polarization. And also, the, we have also noticed that the clusters which are present in the galactic disk, they have uh, they have shown the indication for the presence of dust layers in front of them, while which are located below the galactic disk, they have not shown any indication for the dust layers. Uh, here it is only. So we, uh, we have observed 197 stars in this towards this direction and a single distribution of polarization and position again for all the four that found. Uh, and uh, we have found that there is a magnetic alignment in the region and uh, a dust layer seems to present at 1.2 kpc distance and the uh, majority of uh, stars were found to be in, um, were found to be ism originated polarization having the wavelength uh, for maximum polarization 0.58 which shows that the uh, size distribution is similar to general ism dust grains and polarizing efficiency is similar to the average efficiency of galaxy is found and there are other the variation of lambda max and polarizing efficiency have supports that the, uh, the alignment in this region is due to the radiative torque alignment theory. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. What's this dust concentration due to uh, that distance? Yes, so, sorry. You mentioned like dust concentration at a distance of 1.2. What is it due to? Uh, due to the dust layer, it means dust layer offers at that distance. So the uh, increase in the extension and increase in the polarization offers um, at that distance. Um, yeah, increase. So is it, is, it, is it like a star forming region there? No, actually, um, based on the overall history, so the clusters which are located in the galactic disk, in those clusters we have found dust layers. So maybe that is because of the dust concentration. Yeah, there are no stuff for me. Uh, uh, we can look in the literature and see that. So what's the distance of the cluster, by the way? Uh, around 2.5. Okay. Uh, so we found that these uh, polarization vectors are parallel to the magnetic uh, galactic mm -hmm. So you have you are uh, interpreting that is the alignment of the dust So is there any other uh, is possible there is other, another uh, explanation for this? Yeah, this is the only explanation you can have. Mm -hmm. Magnetic field of your target is parallel to the magnetic mm -hmm. Uh, yes, uh, in this region, because this region is, you know, uh, any cloud is associated with this region, this open star cluster. So, uh, if uh, uh, means if there is a nearby source, if there is any bright illuminating nearby source, then the alignment direction can be different from uh, electric magnetic field. But generally, uh, the direction is uh, means the dust grains are located with the electric magnetic field. In all the theories, means or in all the alignment theories, they have suggested that the mostly the alignment will be towards because of the galactic magnetic field in the region. Or if there is any clouds, then 
The effect of local magnetic field will also occur, and so the direction may be changed from this direction, from the electric magnetic field direction. The other thing is that if there is a high radiation force, hmm. for example, nearby uh, massive star is there, even if you go to the Vasco center to the outside, so the alignment will be changed because of the, that we call the radiant torque alignment rather than the magnetic alignment. So it is possible to distinguish this kind of. Uh, yes. Yes. Actually, if there is any pride, the the in general, they have the massive star, right? That's really yeah, that's because a world out of stars, mm -hmm. maybe it's a certain no, or not. Here, 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 you don't have this one. But if you have a, because the, some stars are uh, clustered at the center because they have a high illumination. So we call that you can go to the back of the slides, the slides. Yeah, no, no, no. let's know that that you saw that. Yes, that is so that increasing of the uh, maximum polarization that is size of the, the dust particle in front of it and the opposite is just so that polarization is increasing toward that. That is the radiative total alignment. Uh, yeah, so, how did you estimate the total extension for all the stars? Uh, we have taken the data from Enders Ecology. All the existing data. Yes. Uh -huh. Okay, and one more question is that uh, have you taken care of the foreground contribution? Because there is a foreground layer, the layer. And that may contribute the uh, maximum contribution, right? Like, so have you taken care of the program subtraction? No, because we have not presented here the uh, polarization for the star. Means we have just presented the um, means all these. Uh, we have not uh, subtracted the program contribution. For we have just given that we may be intrinsically polarized, but we have not given their exact uh, polarization for both intrinsic. So we have not subtracted. Thank you, Sarna, and all other participants of this. I have still an answer to make. Yeah, uh, before we discuss for uh, snacks, so first, uh, it's a reminder that all the certificates are with uh, IOC. So if you want, you can collect these participants in certificates. And then about the travel tomorrow. The bus will start from Mary at 9.15. So those who are in Mary Town, they can come and have a breakfast and then 9.15 will, will start from Mary. And, and travel, or drop or details, like taxi details, I have sent to your emails. So please check it uh, to your respective trains and uh, airports. So if you have any further query, please contact us today only because tomorrow we are traveling. So if, we, if any modification you need, you please let us know that email. So I have sent an email to, uh, to all like those who are going back. So all the details of taxi and So tomorrow morning, uh, those who uh, want to have a bus in Palatal, that option is also there? Yeah. yeah. Okay, so yeah, so 9.30 will start and 9.30-35 will be at Palatal bus station. So you have both options, you can come here and then go or otherwise you go there. So those who are in TR or TRC, so they have to check out tomorrow because up to seventh morning we had. So uh, those who are uh, living on air, so they have to come to Aries and they will stay in Aries. Okay. Yeah, and don't forget to bring your uh, like those who are going to observe or those who are going back luggage. So, <laughs> don't forget to bring sweater also. <laughs> Yeah, uh, 